that that MRCP has to be before the administration of contrast agent. So now let's talk about the interpretation. And again, this just sort of goes through the litany of cases that would sort of change or um, be seen uh, when you use hepatocyte-specific contrast agents. So really, this is a binary question, in my opinion. That's how I teach it to our trainees. Hepatobiliary phase interpretation, you either have it or you don't have it. And in this case, if you, the most of the lesions that you encounter in the liver will not show uptake on the hepatobiliary phase. So if you have a lack of uptake, the hepatobiliary phase is really non-contributory when it comes to lesion characterization and will defer the characterization to other sequences. Now, it is fair to say that sometimes this helps confirm that a lesion is real. In other words, it shows us very clearly that something exists there if we were questioning it on something else. So it's not completely non-contributory. But the important point is that the hepatobiliary phase is a reordering of what the normal expected tissue characteristics are. And so lesions that traditionally had, for example, delayed post-contrast enhancement now actually show very low signal intensity. And that sort of is a flipping of the script that's a, a bit uncomfortable to people when they first see these images. So let's look at one case. This is a metastasis, actually, from a neuroendocrine tumor. And metastasis is one of the areas where EOVIST is highly touted to be very good because it can very clearly show the presence of a lesion since it will be low signal intensity on the HB phase since there are no transport proteins for the, um, for the gadolinium chelate. Here we see a small lesion in the left hepatic lobe, conspicuous arterial enhancement, very hard to see whatsoever on the venous phase image, but on the hepatobiliary phase image, it's nicely outlined as a round mass and very, in this case, confirmed the presence of a neuroendocrine tumor that was suspected based on these images and the clinical history. How about a hemangioma? Well, this again is a case where it sort of flips what we normally expect. A hemangioma classically has peripheral nodular discontinuous enhancement with uh, centripetal accumulation or hyperintensity on delayed phase imaging. And because GAD EOB uh, sort of functions the same way in the first set of images, it's going to show you that peripheral nodular discontinuous enhancement that we expect to see on the early phases of imaging. But notice that on the hepatobiliary phase of imaging, the lesion is relatively hypointense, again, very similar to the hypointense background blood pool. And that's because the contrast in this image is so heavily biased in favor of the uptake within the liver that this lesion now becomes hypointense to the background liver. So again, a sort of a, a reordering of the way we normally think of these. Conventional hepatocellular carcinomas um, most lack the appropriate transport proteins, and so these show up as low signal intensity on the hepatobiliary phase. And so this is a classic HCC in the right hepatic dome where you see arterial hyperenhancement, venous phase washout with a capsule-like enhancement around here. And on the hepatobiliary phase, we see that it's low signal intensity. Now, it's very important to realize that the presence of uh, or the lack of uptake on the hepatobiliary phase is not the same criteria or not the same physiologic thing as venous phase washout, which adds tremendous specificity to the diagnosis of HCC. And so, therefore, looking for hepatobiliary phase uh, lack of uptake really does not define a LIRAD's major criteria, but rather a um, sort of an upgrade feature. It, however, is not the same as venous phase washout and therefore is not a major criteria for the diagnosis of HCC. On the flip side, there's only a few lesions that actually show uptake. And so if you do see uptake, it's actually a relatively concise differential diagnosis. The most common lesion that shows it is focal nodular hyperplasia. There are reported cases of atypical or sometimes called well-differentiated HECs that can do it. And some cirrhotic nodules will exhibit this behavior as well. It's important, again, to remember that this is not a panacea. So the presence of uptake here should not trump all the other diagnostic information. And one question I commonly get asked is, how do you differentiate FNH and atypical HCC? The answer is, you would, you're going to see an FNH behave the same way it should on all the other sequences. So the fact that it takes up contrast on the hepatobiliary phase image should not deter you from that diagnosis. So let's look at that case. Here's a case of an incidental hypervascular mass on a PE CTA. You can see it's showing arterial hypervascularity, relatively isointense signal on the venous phase image. But by the transitional and hepatobiliary phase images, you can see that this is very high signal intensity. This was diagnosed as an FNH, and correctly so. Even without the hepatobiliary phase images, you'd call that an FNH simply based on this dynamic post-contrast behavior. Notice that the central scar, which we often associate with being delayed hyperintensity on um, post-contrast imaging, is actually low signal intensity on the hepatobiliary phase, again, flipping the script from what we're normally used to.
There's in case of an atypical HCC, it's said that about 2 to 8 percent of HCCs will show this paradoxical uptake of contrast material in the hepatobiliary phase. And some people, again, believe it's related to cell differentiation or um, supplying these sufficient transport proteins to, um, to do this. But basically, again, it's really not ambiguous because the early phase images are still diagnostic of HCC. So the presence of arterial enhancement, intralesional washout, and capsule-like enhancement, fulfilling all the major criteria for LIRADS, makes this an HCC. The fact that it takes up contrast here on the hepatobiliary phase is just sort of a bonus if you want to look good for your pathologist and tell them that it's a uh, well-differentiated version or an atypical. And finally, as I mentioned, cirrhotic nodules have a tendency to sometimes show up as hyperintense. The key here is the lack of arterial hypervascularity, which sort of sets them apart from a dysplastic or an HCC type of lesion. So here we can see that there's multiple lesions that are hyperintense on the hepatobiliary phase images, but there's really no corresponding arterial hyperenhancement. These were called cirrhotic nodules and actually have been stable on several subsequent images, uh, subsequent studies. I'll conclude this by just saying that there is some evidence that there might be a future interpretation direction with the use of hepatobiliary agents like GAD-EOB. And that's for trying to identify the at-risk nodule that converts from a dysplastic nodule to an early HCC. It's been suggested that nodules that are greater than 15 millimeters that are hypo-intense on the hepatobiliary phase images should be considered at-risk nodules, particularly if they're solitary, as is the case here. So this is a case from our institution where you can see that there's sort of an isolated low signal intensity nodule that measured 1.6 centimeters in the lateral segment. It doesn't show any arterial enhancement or venous phase washout, but we recommended a short-term follow-up because of this emerging data. And sure enough, in six months, this lesion converted to a classic or conventional HCC, where now you have arterial phase enhancement, venous phase washout, and capsule-like enhancement. So it's possible that there will be an increased role for GAD-EOB in um, trying to determine which nodules are at risk in the cirrhotic liver. So in summary, GAD-EOB DTPA is sort of a novel contrast agent that has this dual pharmacokinetics, and it, it's important to understand how those pharmacokinetics influence the image that you're looking at. But I do think that there is a potential characterization benefit. Most of the lesions that we encounter in the liver have low uptake on the hepatobiliary phase images, so they don't really add anything to it. And though um, some lesions do have striking uptake, and those really are FNH, um, atypical HCCs, and sometimes cirrhotic nodules. And again, remember to look at the other sequences to verify or to help make the diagnosis rather than relying on this sequence alone. Thanks for your attention. So. We're going to move on to the case portion now, and um, the first case series will be um, presented by Myra Feldman from the Cleveland Clinic, and she'll be discussing splenic cases. All right, welcome everyone here in our live studio audience and everyone at home on the interweb. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, we're going to be talking about the spleen. And that's my last case. <laughs> So I have no um, relevant disclosures, and I wanted to state, thank Dr. Rosenblatt, who contributed some of the um, cases that you're going to see today. He's a spleen surgeon at our institution. So this is our first case. It's a 67-year-old female patient with microscopic hematuria, and she was found to have an incidental splenic mass. And I think this is really not an uncommon history for a patient with a splenic lesion. A lot of splenic lesions are identified incidentally in completely asymptomatic patients. So let's take a closer look at our findings. Um, this was a urogram. So we have a non-con image, a venous or nephrographic phase image, and a coronal um, delayed uh, image. On all of these images, we see that there's a bulge in the splenic contour and a well circumscribed round mass. You'll notice that on the non-contrast and on the delayed images, the attenuation of this mass is identical to that of the background spleen. And on the venous phase image, we noticed the mass was just slightly more high attenuation than the background spleen. So the differential we're going to discuss first is that of a vascular splenic mass or enhancing splenic mass. Um, listed in alphabetical order here are angiosarcoma, hamartoma, hemangioma, metastatic disease, and sclerosing angiomatoid nodular transformation of the spleen, which is also sometimes called the Sant lesion. So angiosarcomas, I think people are very worried when they see a vascular enhancing mass in the spleen about this diagnosis, um, but it's important to know a couple of things. 
Uh, number one, it's a very rare tumor. It also happens to be an aggressive tumor. The majority of patients with this tumor um, present with metastatic disease on presentation. The other thing is that these are almost never asymptomatic. So patients may present with symptoms from acute rupture. They may have constitutional symptoms, weight loss, uh, generalized fatigue, that sort of thing that goes along with uh, any neoplasm. Or they may present with signs of hypersplenism from anemia or uh, thrombocytopenia. So here is a case of a patient with an angiosarcoma. You can see the spleen is sort of um, expanded by this really ugly heterogeneous mass. There are areas of heterogeneous enhancement, also areas of non-enhancing tissue, which on pathology corresponded with uh, areas of necrosis. Um, and then if you look closely, you'll see that there are a couple of liver lesions with very similar uh, imaging features to the primary lesion, and those were all metastatic lesions on um, metastatic lesions. The second item in our differential was a hamartoma. And just like anywhere in the body, a hamartoma in the spleen is going to be a benign tumor uh, that's composed of normal splenic elements just in a disorganized fashion, okay? So on uh, these, we have several different imaging sequences here. We have a T2-weighted image, T1 in phase, out of phase, and a post-contrast and about the venous phase of contrast enhancement. On all of these images, our mass uh, is smooth and round. It has identical sequence to the background spleen on uh, our pre-contrast images, and on our post-contrast, almost identical enhancement to the background spleen. So that's a hamartoma. Hemangiomas, I think you guys are all very familiar with diagnosing these uh, in the liver. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind about uh, hemangiomas in the spleen is that the typical enhancement pattern that we see in the liver, so that of peripheral interrupted nodules of enhancement with delayed centripetal fill-in, that particular um, imaging pattern is actually not very commonly seen in the spleen. So these lesions will enhance and they show sort of more progressive delayed enhancement, but you don't see that characteristic pattern. So let's take a look at this case here. Just like in the liver, the uh, hemangiomas in the spleen are gonna be T2 hyperintense. And you'll notice that the degree of uh, hyperintense signal is similar to the CSF. Um, they may not pop out at you as much in the spleen, uh, and that's just due to the fact that the spleen background tissue is uh, more hyperintense than the liver on T2-weighted images. Um, on, for our case, the lesions were iso-intense, the background spleen on the T1-weighted images. They showed a little bit of enhancement on the arterial phase with some more uh, uh, delayed enhancement. Metastatic disease. Uh, so this was sort of an unusual case. Metastatic disease can occur in the spleen. It's been described with, um, you know, cancers, breast cancers, lung cancers, um, colon cancers, uh, skin cancers, such as melanoma, which is what this patient had. Uh, important thing to know about splenic metastasis is that they usually occur in the setting of widespread metastasis, which is why this case was really unusual for us. This was a patient with a newly diagnosed melanoma, underwent imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and um, we found only one lesion, and it's this lesion here. It's low attenuation with some internal enhancement. The patient went on a, to PET scan, and this was the only FDG avid uh, lesion in the whole body. So isolated splenic uh, metastasis can occur. It's, it's rare, and really the more common finding would be to see um, diffuse metastatic disease everywhere. The final lesion uh, for our first differential was a SANT lesion. Uh, these are benign vascular splenic lesions. Uh, histopathologically, they're angiomatoid nodules, which are surrounded by fibrous uh, tissue. They're usually identified incidentally. One feature that um, may sort of clue you into the diagnosis is that they do tend to have T2 hypointense signal, and that is thought to be due to the presence of hemosiderin from prior hemorrhage within these lesions. So this is a case of, of a SANT lesion, and you can see on our T2-weighted image, the spleen, uh, the lesion is more hypo-intense than the background spleen. On the T1 in phase, we had a couple of areas of susceptibility artifact or blooming artifact, which were also probably due to areas of uh, hemorrhage. Um, the lesion showed it's enhancing less on the arterial phase in the background spleen, but did show uh, delayed enhancement. So if we take it back to our index case here, what is the correct diagnosis? Hopefully you guys all put this together. It, uh, this was a patient with a hemartoma. 
So a couple of teaching points uh, for vascular splenic lesions. There is some overlap in the uh, imaging appearance of these lesions, but some of the benign lesions that we discussed, the hamartoma, hemangioma, sant lesions, may show characteristic imaging features which uh, suggest the diagnosis. And if you have an incidental lesion with benign imaging features in an asymptomatic patient, these really uh, can be just managed expectantly. You don't need to go on to uh, biopsy or, or anything like that. Moving on to our second case, this is a 40-year-old male patient who had a suspected right pheochromocytoma. That diagnosis was suspected based on a mass found on ultrasound and biochemical evidence of the diagnosis, um, and the surgeon wanted a CT scan for uh, surgical planning. And when we go through this next case, I want you guys all to be thinking about what would be the next best step in management for this patient. So let's take a closer look at our imaging findings. Um, our spleen is not enlarged. Um, on both the non-contrast image and the venous phase image, we see that there's almost homogeneous enhancement of the entire spleen. And it's really just on this arterial phase that you see there are numerous uh, low attenuation lesions throughout the spleen. Those of you with eagle eyes in the audience may see this uh, enhancing vascular mass of the right adrenal, which was the pheochromocytoma. So the differential we're going to discuss here is multiple splenic lesions, uh, and that can be caused by infection, literal cell angioma, lymphoma, or sarcoid. Uh, so first in our differential is infection. This was a patient who presented with some nonspecific, um, you know, generalized sort of infectious symptoms. He had uh, an enlarged spleen on imaging, numerous low attenuation lesions throughout the spleen. If you look really closely, there are also some subcentimeter um, liver lesions as well, low attenuation. He also had a perfectly enhancing fluid collection in his right chest wall here. Uh, we did go on to aspirate this and... Um, came up with the unusual diagnosis of a cryptococcal infection. He was treated for this, and the um, findings in the spleen and liver did resolve. Here's another case of a patient with a hematogenous can candida infection. Spleen is not enlarged in this case, but you can see there are numerous subcentimeter low attenuation spleen and liver lesions, um, and these also resolved after treatment. The second thing in our differential is a literal cell angioma. Um, so these are sort of an unusual uh, tumor. They are uh, basically benign vascular lesions. Uh, they arise from the literal cells of the red pulp. And they're usually identified incidentally, but uh, some reports in literature kind of describe this, um, that they may be seen in patients who are immunocompromised or have an underlying malignancy. Uh, imaging features, usually multiple low attenuation lesions. If you are lucky enough to have delayed, uh, you know, delayed venous phase imaging, uh, you may see uh, delayed uh, homogeneous enhancement to the background spleen. But overall, the appearance is really nonspecific on imaging, and the diagnosis should be confirmed histopathologically. So here's a patient who came to us. Um, he had known chronic pancreatitis and presented with new symptoms of left abdominal pain. Um, we saw this, he has an enlarged spleen here with numerous low attenuation lesions throughout the spleen. Uh, we didn't know what this was. We kind of were suspicious of a lymphoma. He went on to lymph node biopsies, bone marrow biopsies. None of that yielded a diagnosis of um, lymphoma. Finally, um, he went to a spleen biopsy and this was diagnosed as a literal cell angioma. Uh, here's a case of lymphoma. You can see a lot of these imaging findings uh, sort of overlap with our last case. So again, our spleen is enlarged, numerous low attenuation lesions throughout the spleen, on, uh, and then no lesions at all in the liver. Um, this patient had a PET scan. Aside from maybe an area of necrosis centrally, the lesions were all FTG avid. Um, so while lymphoma is the most common neoplasm to occur in the spleen, less than 2% of all lymphomas are isolated to the spleen. So you're generally going to see splenic involvement with disease elsewhere. The final thing in our differential uh, of multiple splenic lesions is sarcoid. Uh, again, something we're very used to diagnosing in the chest maybe, uh, but can have intra-abdominal involvement as well. Uh, findings here, an enlarged spleen. A little bit harder to see this even on my uh, windowed image here, but there are numerous subcentimeter low attenuation lesions throughout both the spleen and the liver, um, and of course, several enlarged uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes. This was a patient who had a known diagnosis of sarcoid, but did go on to a liver biopsy to confirm uh, involvement there. So what is the next best step in management of this patient? 
Well, we didn't know what this was, so we went on to biopsy, and this was diagnosed as a literal cell angioma. So a couple of teaching points here about multiple splenic lesions. Really, this can be a diagnostic conundrum, because as you've seen, there's a really nonspecific imaging appearance for a lot of these uh, the items in our differential. Um, you can consider medical history, clinical symptoms, and other imaging findings to help clue you into the diagnosis. Um, I think a lot of people are very scared of spleen biopsy because at the end of the day, the spleen is sort of like a big bag of blood and we're nervous about sticking needles into it. But it can be done for, uh, safely. Um, in fact, studies have shown that the risk of major complication from biopsying the spleen is similar to that of other solid organ biopsies. Um, and of course, if you consider your alternative of splenectomy, you know, that is not a benign procedure. Uh, puts the patient at risk for a lifelong of uh, morbidity. Okay, case three uh, is a patient from Egypt with uh, abdominal pain. Our findings here, we have a fluid attenuation splenic cyst with some higher attenuation internal uh, debris. Uh, there are peripheral calcifications within the splenic lesion. There's also a peripheral cyst within a cyst. Uh, this is a non-con and a, a contrast enhanced image. There is no enhancement between the two images. And if you see, there are also cystic lesions with similar appearance in both the liver and the uh, mesentery. So cystic lesions are a super common incidental finding um, that we see day in and day out. Um, and you're going to want to consider this differential, abscess, hydatid cyst, lymphangioma, true or secondary cysts. So first in our differential is abscess. Uh, you can, patients can develop splenic abscess by hematogenous spread, penetrating injury, um, or sometimes a result of an infarction. Um, just like anywhere else in the abdomen, um, abscess in the spleen is going to be predominantly fluid attenuation or uh, hypoechoic with increased through transmission on our ultrasound image here. We have gas within this abscess on the ultrasound images. Uh, you recognize gas as linear echoes. Um, we also had a, cute, a few sub-centimeter um, liver lesions, which may have been microabscesses too, I'm not sure. Um, we went on to, as you can see from this image, aspirate and drain that splenic lesion. Hydatid cysts, these are seen uh, in the presence of econococcal infections. Um, involvement of the spleen is very rare, less than 2%, and usually if you have splenic involvement, um, it's in the setting of uh, widespread abdominal disease uh, or, or liver involvement. Um, the appearance is very variable in the spleen. Um, you can see the whole gamut of econococcal cysts um, in the spleen. Unilateral, multilateral, you could have, um, or multilaculated rather, you could have a high attenuation material internally due to hydatid uh, cysts or infl inflammation. And you may see peripheral calcifications or daughter cysts. This is an example from the literature. We have a multilaculated cyst, T2 hypointense, hyperintense, sorry, T1 hypointense. And I think the liver lesion here shows the more characteristic appearance with multiple peripheral daughter cysts. Lymphangioma. A developmental lesion that can occur uh, almost anywhere in the body, including the spleen. And you sort of see multiple fluid-filled channels, uh, some of which are peripheral in location and no enhancing components. Uh, finally, true or, or secondary splenic cysts. Um, true cysts are developmental with an epithelial lining. Secondary cysts are thought to arise from prior trauma or hemorrhage. Um, we cannot distinct, uh, distinguish these by imaging um, and really that differentiation is not important because these are sort of benign, no-touch lesions. Um, and you can see here was a case I saw in 2015 with identical imaging uh, appearance in 2009. Um, and another one we had were peripheral calcifications, no FDG av avidity, and stable over a number of years. Um, so hopefully you guys put this together. This was a hydatid cyst. Teaching points for splenic lesion, very common incidental uh, finding. Imaging may help you separate the infectious causes from the benign cysts. Uh, benign cysts are generally left alone. Very rarely, if um, a, you know, a cyst is very large and very symptomatic to a patient, um, they can be treated with uh, splenectomy or spleen uh, sparing surgeries. Okay, our final case here is a 61-year-old female who had uh, severe left upper quadrant pain following a colonoscopy, um, and the patient, on further questioning after the CT was done, uh, did report similar episodes of pain uh, prior to her colonoscopy. So findings on this, we have the stomach is distended with contrast in the left upper quadrant, and probably the more salient finding is there was no spleen in the left upper quadrant. When we scroll down a little bit, we see that the uh, splenic vein takes uh, an unexpected course 
uh, anteriorly here. We also noted that the pancreas uh, had, uh, was sort of hypo-enhancing in the tail compared to the body. We scroll down further, sort of at the level of the umbilicus here. We do find a spleen in an abnormal position and an abnormal orientation with the hilum directed uh, posteriorly. So for this case, it really, I don't think, is a differential. This is a diagnosis of a wandering spleen. This is something that happens um, when there is absence or laxity of the gastrosplenic and splenorenal ligaments. And uh, the spleen can basically torse along that long pedicle, which is composed of the splenic vessels and the pancreatic tail. Uh, it, you know, this does render the spleen at risk for infarction. Um, so patients can either present, uh, they could be asymptomatic, they could present with pain, maybe even a palpable mass from that spleen in an abnormal location. And treatment of this is splenopexy or if the uh, spleen has infarcted splenectomy. I did uh, include a differential here, which was just that of an abnormal location of spleen. So we have a couple things on our list, accessory spleen, heterotaxia, and splenosis. Accessory spleens are basically a result of developmental failure, so islands of splenic tissue that do not coalesce to form the spleen. 95% of accessory spleens are located in the uh, expected location uh, or around the spleen. Um, and if you're lucky, you may see an arterial supply coming right off of the splenic artery. Uh, important thing to remember about these is that their signal attenuation and uh, enhancement is similar to that of background spleen. Um, these are most commonly mistaken for other neoplasms, as was the case with this patient. Um, her spleen is in the expected location, and you see there's an ovoid mass, which was higher attenuation than the background pancreas, and similar in attenuation to the spleen. This patient went on to MR imaging, and again, you see the spleen's in the expected location. Uh, this mass is identical to the uh, signal intensity to the spleen on T2, T1 weighted images, and on the contrast enhanced images shows identical enhancement pattern to the background spleen. Uh, so this was a patient with an accessory spleen. Heterotaxy syndromes come in two flavors. Um, so the right-sided isomerism usually presents very early on in life uh, due to association with cyanotic heart disease. Um, but left-sided isomerism can present um, in late childhood or adulthood as this patient. Um, and this is the one that has, is associated with polysplenism. This patient had multiple spleens. I think we counted about four of them in the left upper quadrant. And she also had other uh, imaging features which go along with this condition, including uh, discontinuous IVC with azygous continuation and non-rotation of bowel. Uh, her small bowel is located entirely uh, on the right and colon here on the left. Finally, splenosis, different entity from accessory spleen. This occurs in the setting of post-trauma. I think the importance of this is the same as accessory spleen in that um, uh, the, the splenosis can sometimes be confused for uh, other masses. That was the case with this patient who uh, had a rectal mass identified at an outside institution. A colon rectal surgeon at our institution did a colonoscopy, didn't see the mass, and had us review the images. So here you can see a um, soft tissue perirectal mass. Uh, there is no spleen on the left of her quadrant. This is a little bit of pancreatic tail here. Um, and then as we searched the images a little bit more thoroughly, we found two soft tissue attenuation nodules in the mid and uh, left of her quadrant. Uh, to confirm this diagnosis, we went on to a technetium-labeled uh, denatured red blood scan. And you can see that all of those lesions did uh, pick up the denatured red blood cells. You could also use technetium-labeled sulfur colloid to confirm the diagnosis of splenic tissue. So splenic tissue in ectopic locations can mimic uh, tumor or abnormal lymph nodes, and that's why it's important to be aware of this. Um, and it's also important if a patient has like hypersplenism and is going to splenectomy, uh, it's important, uh, critical to that you identify all accessory sites of splenic tissue, um, as if you leave any behind, you know, these patients will be at risk for a recurrence of uh, hypersplenism. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Myra. And I just wanted to say that you know this is running concurrently, as Myra mentioned, with the virtual course. So um, we're going to do a Q and A session at the end of the uh, presentation. So those in the audience, as well as those in the virtual audience, if you have questions, just keep submitting them, and we'll queue them up for the end. Um, the uh, next presenter is going to be uh, Neil Hansen from the University of Nebraska, and he's going to be doing pancreas case review. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience for coming this morning, as well as everyone in the, uh, the virtual meeting for logging on this morning. So I'm going to be showing four pancreas cases. I have no relevant disclosures. 
Our first case is a 54-year-old male who, uh, much like many of the cases Myra showed, had an incidental loma. He originally had a renal stone CT done for flank pain, and then that uh, led to the diagnosis of a uh, hypodense pancreatic lesion. So I'm going to show four representative images here. We have an axial, non-contrast CT at the level of the pancreatic head, an uncinate process. We have an axial T2-weighted image at a similar level. We have a coronal T2-weighted image uh, from an MRI done at the level of the common bile duct and pancreatic head. And then we have an oblique coronal MRCP image uh, from that same MRI. And as we go through this, we're not doing audience responses here, but I did want people just to think of this question as we go through the findings. Say your pancreatic surgeon came to you with this case and he asked, what should I do with this incidentally detected pancreatic cyst? Should I take it out with the Whipple right now? Should we follow it up? Should I completely ignore it and tell the patient not to worry about it? Or should I pad the radiologist's pockets and immediately proceed to a multiphasic CT scan? So to go over the findings, there's a 2.3 centimeter hypodense mass, very nonspecific imaging appearance in the pancreatic head and uncinate process. That mass is mostly T2 hyperintense, almost entirely fluid signal, and had a few thin septations uh, within, its, uh, with, within the mass. On the coronal MRI image, we can see that it's, uh, again, cystic, doesn't have any enhancing nodular component, there's no main pancreatic ductal dilatation associated with it, and there's no parenchymal atrophy. And then the key to diagnosis in this case is going to be our MRCP images, where you can see there's communication here with the pancreatic duct. So our differential diagnosis for an incidentally detected cystic pancreatic mass, we're going to go through it, uh, lymphoempithelial cyst, microcystic serous cyst adenoma, a mucinous neoplasm or a side branch, introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm or an IPMN. So first up, this uh, turned out to be a lymphoepithelial cyst. This is a very uh, benign uh, but uh, very rare cyst. Typically, it's seen in older men. This did, in fact, happen to be an 80-year-old male. It has variable imaging findings. Uh, here, this case is kind of mildly multilocular with some internal thin septations, uh, but they can be unilocular and they're typically lined with squamous epithelium. They're very difficult to definitively characterize on MRI and not infrequently uh, we cannot provide a specific imaging diagnosis for these. Next up on the differential would be a microcystic cirrhosis adenoma. This is the classic grandmother lesion. Typically it's in older females age 65 and greater. It's benign. It's composed of numerous tiny cysts with internal septations. Uh, they can have uh, radiations from a central scar, uh, but this was a, a cirrhosis adenoma. Next up on the differential would be a mucinous neoplasm. Uh, this is most commonly uh, referred to as a mother lesion, uh, seen in middle-aged women, usually in the pancreatic body or tail. Um, these are unilocular usually and have, uh, as in this case, kind of a thick peripheral rim of ovarian stroma commonly. And these have a malig uh, malignant potential, so any enhancing elements should raise concern for a carcinoma. In fact, this was a 35-year-old female who had this kind of subtly enhancing nodule within the cystic lesion, and it turned out to be an uh, area of carcinoma when it was resected. And then finally, the last in our differential is the side branch IPMN. Uh, the key to diagnosing this is communication with the pancreatic duct. The side branch type is much less likely to be malignant than the main duct type, but here you can see there's just a thin communication here with the pancreatic duct. So that was the side branch IPMN. So what would you do? It's very institution specific uh, in terms of recommendations. At our institution, uh, we would typically follow this up with an endoscopic ultrasound in three to six months and then alternate uh, the follow-up with MRI. And if there are any suspicious features on ultrasound, a fine needle aspiration may be performed. So teaching points for these cystic pancreatic lesions, you know, they're commonly encountered as an incidental loma. Um, and most of them are benign, demonstrate benign biologic behavior. However, some do have a malignant potential, and there is an increased risk of not only invasive carcinoma within the cyst, but also elsewhere in the pancreas. Uh, 
And uh, the literature is, uh, is showing that that's a real increased risk for developing pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which uh, obviously has a very bad prognosis frequently. There's numerous follow-up guidelines available. The ACR has a guideline available through their white paper. Uh, the 2012 Pancreatic uh, International Consensus Committee has guidelines available. At my institution, we take a multidisciplinary approach and we actually follow these guidelines. But these guidelines are constantly in evolution and changing. And so it's just important that you're on board with your gastroenterologists and pancreatic surgeons so that you manage these all in, uh, in kind of a standardized fashion. Aggressive features for these cystic lesions include obstructive jaundice, main pancreatic ductal dilatation, size if it gets greater than three centimeters, or if there's any sort of solid enhancing component that's going to prompt removal. All right, case number two, if this isn't a leading history, I don't know what it is. Uh, we got a 33-year-old male, he's got chronic abdominal pain, and he happens to have hearing loss related to a prior endolymphatic sac tumor. And so we have an axial contrast enhanced CT scan at the level of the right kidney and pancreatic head, an uncinib process. And slightly higher up, we have another image from that same contrast enhanced CT scan. And then since this is the pancreatic section, I just wanted to focus your attention to the pancreatic uh, uncinib process here. So let's go through the findings. So first, there's a, around a one centimeter hypervascular enhancing uncinib process mass. We have an enhancing renal mass, and in fact, there are more than one. He has several renal masses in the right kidney. And then there's numerous cysts, both in the kidney, we have renal cysts, as well as in the pancreas, we have pancreatic parenchymal cysts. And then kind of the eye test of the day, within the spinal canal, there's a small enhancing mass um, that was brightly enhancing also. So our differential diagnosis for a hypervascular pancreatic mass includes an accessory spleen, metastatic disease, neuroendocrine tumors, and... We are going to just look at basically what we see on imaging. But Brodman actually went through and came up with 52 areas based on function. And he did this before functional imaging. They did it by cytoarchitecture. And it's pretty much held up to functional imaging. Now, I'm not going to drive you guys crazy by going through 52 Brodmann areas, which don't really relate to what we see on imaging. So I'm actually going to go over the anatomic aspect. But when I do that, I want you to keep in mind that not everyone's brain's quite the same. There is some variability. And including for these functional areas, it'll vary in size from person to person, and in even some cases, depending on the age of the person. So just kind of keep that in mind, but hopefully it'll give you some landmarks that you're able to use. And one of them is the central sulcus. You, it, to me, it's amazing how much time has been devoted to identifying the central sulcus. I found so many articles on different signs, and there are at least 10 different signs to find this thing because it's a very important area. Obviously, your primary motor and sensory cortex lie right around the central sulcus. So first off, I'm going to go over some of the best ways to find it. And as I mentioned, there's quite a list. So we'll go over some of these. I'm not going to read them all out, obviously, because we're going to go through them. And like I said, it was quite stunning to see the number of articles on this. One of the easiest ones, and the one I frequently use, uh, is just looking, going from your superior frontal sulcus. It'll lead you right into the precentral sulcus, as you can see right here. And there are two ways people describe this. You can also use the gyrus and going to the precentral gyrus. And they call this the L sign. So a little L there to help you figure it out. Or you can use the superfrontal sulcus to the precentral sulcus, and that makes a nice little upside down T, and they call that the T sign. And they're actually two T signs. You can use the superior frontal sulcus, or you can use the inferior frontal sulcus to the precentral sulcus, and that's your second T. Now, just as a little aside while I go through these, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the functions of these areas. So this pure frontal gyrus is pretty much going to be that area that functions in self-awareness. And I actually find it interesting because it involves the prefrontal cortex, and that's where your executive functions are. And I happen to have a son who has disorders of executive functioning. And that can be quite difficult for a person. It impairs your ability to plan and to go through with your plans. So you can imagine kind of what, what kind of challenges we have gone through with dealing with that. Also has your secondary motor cortex, which I will touch on. And interestingly enough, uh, they have found, at least in some patients, when they stimulate the superior frontal cortex, you get laughter. 
The patient may not be able to tell you why they're laughing, but you will get laughter in some cases. The other thing I have marked up here, and this is what I tell my medical students, it's kind of easy. When you deal with cortical anatomy, if you just say superior, middle, and inferior, you'll get several of the gyri from multiple lobes. You have superior, middle, and inferior in the frontal lobe, you have it in the occipital lobe, and you have it in the temporal lobe. So right off the bat, you've got three gyri down for each uh, lobe, except the parietal lobe, which likes to be different. It has a superior parietal lobule and an inferior parietal lobule. One of the other ways we can identify the central sulcus is on the precentral gyrus, you'll see this little knob. People call it the hand knob. Or it also is called the hook sign. I'll show you why it's called a hook in a second. And this looks more like a knob. But the interesting thing about this, you don't always see it in people. Or it may have a little bit of different morphology. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a second. The other thing is it varies from side to side. You see it's much more pronounced here on the left versus the right. And some people think that has to do with which hand the patient has. Or which handedness of the patient, that is. Here's a patient who wound up with some left hand weakness. And they wound up with an infarct. A strategically placed infarct right on the hand knob. This is from the AJNR. Again, it's, a, like I said, unbelievable how many articles there are out there about the area around the central sulcus. But as you can see from this, this hand knob can have a variety of morphologies, and some people don't even have one at all. So it's not always a reliable sign. Like I said, some of these signs for finding the central sulcus will be there in some people. They'll be, not be there in others or be less pronounced. This is why they call it the hook. If you look on the sagittal image, there's the central sulcus. This downward projecting area corresponds to that hand knob. And if you draw a line down from that, you wind up along the posterior aspect of the insula. Okay. And this should say marginal ramus of the cingulate sulcus, not gyrus. For some reason, I have a gyri sulci backwards forward thing, like some people have left right. I tend to have that for some reason with gyri and sulci. But anyway, if you look at the cingulate gyrus right here, the sulcus above, it's a cingulus, cingulate sulcus. And eventually, this will turn and make its way to the surface of the brain. And that's called the marginal ramus of the cingulate sulcus. The sulcus right in front of the marginal ramus is going to be the central sulcus. And around that is a paracentral lobule. That's where you have your motor and sensory cortex, motor anteriorly, sensory posteriorly. Now, why in the world do I have a picture of a belt up here? Kind of a weird thing to stick in the middle of a brain thing. Well, cingulate comes from cingulum, which in Latin means belt or girdle. And since the cingulate sulcus and cingulate gyrus go around the corpus callosum, that's why it was named the cingulate. Okay. So the cingulate gyrus is part of the limbic system, and limbic is part of our uh, motion formation, memory, learning, that type of thing. You can see it nicely here on the coronal. I found it kind of interesting that limbic and limbo come from the same root word. Um, basically, it means a border or borderland, and those people who were in limbo were kind of in a transition or borderland. So that's where the name limbic comes from because it is a, actually forms a border. If you look at it, it's sort of um, central, separates the hemispheres from the brain stem. So if you look at sort of your parts of the limbic si system being the cingulate gyrus, your fornix, separates the cerebral hemispheres from the brain stem. So the pars bracket sign. So as I mentioned, you have the pars marginalis coming to the circuit, surface. This is it. Some people think it looks like a mustache. Uh, you can use your imagination. Maybe it kind of does. But what you'll see is you have the central sulcus points right at it. So if you see a little sulcus here with a sulcus pointing at it, that's a clue that you're, the one pointing is the central sulcus. I like to think that if you roll a ball along the central sulcus, it'll land right in the bracket. So it points right to it. This is one I find to be less reliable, the bifid post-central uh, sulcus sign. So here's the post-central sulcus. In this case, it splits. Here's your pars bracket. And then also, you can have a bifid post-central sulcus, a gyrus, which is this one. But you know, I don't find that one to be quite as useful. So sometimes it's helpful, but a lot of times I just don't really see that nice anatomy as this patient happens to have. Okay, And then, the postcentral sulcus or postcentral gyrus tends to be thinner than the precentral gyrus. It's another thing. Okay. And then one of the last ones I'm going to talk about is the interparietal sulcus. So it connects up with the postcentral sulcus, makes sort of an arc 
along the brain. You can see from actually the anatomic picture here where you have the postcentral sulcus and then you have the inner parietal sulcus going along, separating the superior parietal lobule from the inferior parietal lobule. And again, this one I see every once in a while. It's not as reliable. Like I said, you don't always see these in everybody. And the inner parietal uh, sulcus is kind of interesting. That's where you have your perceptual motor coordination and your visual attention. Okay. Subcentral gyrus. This is basically connecting the pre and postcentral gyri inferiorly. They call this a U sign since it looks sort of like a U. Uh, they say in the literature this is one of the most reliable signs that you can use to find the central sulcus. But I usually, I don't tend to use this one quite as much, but this has been more recently described. The M sign is along the uh, inferior frontal gyrus. It makes a nice little M, as you can see right here. Um, has three parts, the pars orbitalis up by the eye, pars triangularis, looks like a little bit of a triangle, and the pars opercularis along the operculum. These latter two parts are going to be a part of speech. This is where Broca's area is located. And just to show you an example of why it can be important to know where the central sulcus is. So here's a patient with a large hemorrhagic melanoma metastasis. Um, you can see the anatomy nicely on the right-hand side, but it's kind of obscured. On the left, it's hard to tell exactly where that central sulcus is. this thing in the parietal lobe? Is this thing in the frontal lobe? Well, if you actually go and use that M sign, because the M sign, the posterior part of the M, is going to connect with the precentral gyrus. So now that I look at my M here, I think I actually made it, yep, visual help there, you can see here is the precentral gyrus, so this is postcentral. So this is in the parietal lobe. Okay. Some people will do this. There are articles, this was from the AJNR, about using the Mercator view or pancake view, basically, where you reformat the cortex, flatten it out, so you can see all the different signs. I, I don't know how many people are doing that. Does anyone here really do that? Uh, I've seen cases of it, but I've never done it purpose, uh, myself. But you can see it does show the different signs. Here's the M sign. Here's the U sign, the hand knob, the bifid postcentral gyrus. And here's the L. This patient actually had a bifid superior frontal gyrus. So you can see it's coming along. There are two L's. So again, the anatomy varies from person to person. The reason why I have a map up here, the Mercator view, was named after the man who actually learned how to take a round structure, such as the Earth, and flatten it out into a nice map that they could easily use back in the way back uh, for sailing. Okay, so talking about boundaries, well, the central sulcus is one boundary. So that's the boundary between the frontal and parietal lobe. Where are the boundaries between other areas? Well, the parietal and occipital lobe are separated by the parietal occipital sulcus. I like it when they actually name things after what they show, so that's nice. Uh, and it's a nice uh, little landmark to use to separate them, but the other thing you can do is to look at, to develop, uh, look at it to assess for the degree of atrophy within the brain. And when we're thinking about patients who have Alzheimer's, we're worried about the parietal region, we're worried about the temporal region, and this is one sulcus, the degree of widening you can use. And they came up with a scale, it's called the Codem scale, named after the person who helped develop it. If you have a patient who has no atrophy, like this, it's a zero. And you get to a patient who's like this, where you get a more substantial widening, they're going to be about a two. And so if you have a patient who is greater than a, you know, a one or two, and they're under 75, it's a little bit more worrisome. Okay. The temporal and frontal and parietal lobe boundary is going to be the sylvian fissure, or the lateral fissure, named after a Dutch anatomist, Sylvius. Uh, and it's one of the earliest developing sulci. So we can see that even when we look at fetal anatomy. So looking at the size, it's 21 weeks. You can already see the sylvian fissure has started to develop. So it's going to be one of the earlier developing sulci. And it's a nice, it's the boundary between, like I said, the temporal frontal and parietal lobe. The temporal and occipital lobe, on the other hand, doesn't have a nice boundary. Um, Basically, what a lot of anatomists will do to separate the two, because you can see just from this drawing, that the temporal lobe just sort of blends in with the occipital lobe. Uh, basically, if you take the parietal occipital fissure and draw an imaginary line down to this notch on the inferior base of the temporal lobe called the preoccipital notch, that's sort of how anatomists make the distinction between the two, is this line that they kind of draw in their head. But basically, they just sort of continue together. 
So now, moving on from that, I'm talking about some of the cortical sensory areas because these are going to be some important areas uh, when we're dealing with patients who have lesions. <coughs> Primary somatosensory, as I mentioned, that is going to be on the postcentral gyrus. That is where you're going to have your sensations related to touch, such as pressure, vibration, temperature, that type of thing. This was a patient who unfortunately had a primary brain sarcoma, a rather rare lesion. You can tell from the location this was in the anterior aspect of the parietal lobe, but you can obviously see it also involves the posterior portion of the, at least from mass effect, of the frontal lobe. So this patient had both numbness and weakness involving their left calf. And obviously if you damage it, you're going to have a loss of touch and proprioception and also issues related to temperature and pain and that type of thing. So one of the more interesting areas, I think, is the major association cortex. It's these two little areas called the superior marginal gyrus and the angular gyrus. And they're in the inferior parietal lobule. And basically, they deal with multi-century perception, but you can see what happens if you have damage in the dominant hemisphere. You lose a lot of things. You wind up with aphasia, and it's kind of interesting to think why. Well, where is Wernicke's? You can see the supermarginal gyrus right here. It blends in with the postcentral gyrus. Here's the precentral, has the hook. And it also blends in with the superior temporal gyrus. And right in this sort of area of purple, that's sort of loosely where Wernicke's area is. It varies a little bit in people. Some people will have it larger or smaller, but it tends to be located along the posterior aspect of the superior temporal gyrus. So obviously, if you have damage in this area, you're going to have issues with aphasia. One of the other things you'll have issues with is a calculator. You'll have difficulty with math. The inferior parietal lobule is where your ability to do mathematical calculations is located. And they actually say that Einstein's inferior parietal lobule was 15% larger than the average person. Now, when you damage this area on the dominant hemisphere, this whole uh, constellation of symptoms is called Grossman syndrome. The precuneus, this part of the superior parietal lobule. Uh, basically, we didn't quite understand some of what this area did. It's not an area that's prone to getting injured too much, say by a vascular insult or gunshot wounds. It's sort of located centrally. But the more and more we've learned about it, we realize that there's visual areas, and that's going to be located closer to the occipital lobe. We have some cognitive associative areas, and then some sensory motor, which is going to be located near the central sulcus. Bottom, the uh, boundaries of it are going to be the marginal ramus of the cingulate sulcus, the subparietal sulcus, and the parietal occipital sulcus. Okay. Your primary visual cortex, pretty much when you talk about the occipital lobe, the main uh, function in the occipital lobe is all visual for the or large part. The calcarine sulcus, which sort of divides the occipital lobe in half, so here's the parietal occipital sulcus. The one that's dividing in half, this is the lingual gyrus, and this is the cuneus, uh, is going to be where the primary visual cortex is located. They call it calcarine because calcarine means like a hook or a claw, and they usually, when they talk about that hook or claw or a spur, they're referring to what you see on the back of a rooster's leg. This patient has a tiny little cavernous malformation right along their primary visual cortex. As far as I know, this was an incidental finding, so they weren't having any symptoms related. Secondary visual areas. Now, these are some kind of interesting areas. And one of my, uh, if you want to say I pick a favorite gyrus, I think it's kind of interesting, the fusiform gyrus. Um, this is one of the areas of the brain that's concerned with facial recognition. That's why I have this lovely selfie of my son that he's stuck on my cell phone as wallpaper. Trust me, he's not that freakish looking. Um, but it does look kind of freaky. Um, if you have damage to your fusiform gyrus, you can wind up with something called prosopagnosia, which means facial blindness. You can't recognize faces. Some people are born this way, um, actually develop or you know, have had this all their life. I've read about a woman who couldn't even read, recognize her own face in the mirror, could not recognize the face of her husband or children. They use other things to recognize people, but faces are a big problem. And when they've looked at children who have autism, and they're evaluating them with functional MRI. When they show them faces, a normal person, this area of the brain, there would be some response. People who have autism don't. Uh, people who tend to be like Asperger's do tend to have a, a little bit of difficulty with facial recognition. The other thing I want to put, point out here is I put superior, middle, and inferior. Like I said in the beginning, if you get superior, middle, and inferior down, you've got names of 
a lot of gyri or sulci already in the brain, gyri and sulci, because they're superior gyri and superior sulci. Also notice that when I talk about the fusiform gyrus, it goes by another name as well, the occipitotemporal gyrus. Again, because there's, that sort of, there's no real good um, boundary, so it kind of blends in. It goes into the occipital lobe. Another gyrus within the brain is the perihippocampal, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. It sits right underneath the hippocampus there. Okay. So the lingual gyrus, as I mentioned already, uh, it's going to be part of the occipital lobe. It's called the lingual gyrus because they thought it looked like a tongue. That's why it gets that name. And it has an interesting role. It's part of the role of vision and dreams. So when you're seeing things in your dreams, it's this gyrus that is part of that. And it also helps to encode the visual memories. The second part, as I mentioned, is the cuneus. Uh, it has information regarding the inferior visual field and visual processing. It gets its name because it's wedge-shaped. That's what it means. And you'll notice that, that part of this pure parietal lobule is called the precuneus because it's in front of it. And where this comes from is this nice little wedge-shaped in Roman theaters. Uh, basically, that's where the term comes from. It means like a wedge shape, and usually it related to the theaters. Now, the primary auditory co cortex, that's from the te uh, transverse temporal gyrus of Heschel. This was Heschel. He's the man who described it. He was an anatomist. Um, so obviously, if you have some damage to this area, you're going to wind up with problems with hearing and also problems with sound localization. It's an interesting gyrus, I guess, in a way. All the temporal gyrus, gyri go front to back, except Heschel's. It goes medial to lateral. So it's the only one that kind of crosses over, and it makes this nice little bump on top of the temporal lobe. Now, the primary gustatory cortex, it's a little bit difficult to pin down. Uh, they've done a lot of studies uh, using functional. They found that in some people, the parietal or, per or perculum, or not just functional, but also people who have damaged areas. Frontal operculum also tends to be an area where it seems like it may be localized, and primates so is where it is. Uh, but in humans, it's not quite so clear, medial temporal lobe or posterior insula. But for the most part, it's going to be located somewhere around the operculum. If you have irritative, uh, irritative lesions there, you're going to get hallucinations in taste. And obviously, if it's damaged, you're going to have impairment in taste. And what is a perculum? What does it mean? It means a little lid. And when I think about it, I used to collect seashells when I was little. And the seashells, the little animals, they have this little hard covering, and they can close up their shell. And that's an operculum. So basically, it's going to be the covering of the insula. So you have your frontal operculum, the parietal operculum, and the temporal operculum that are going to cover the area of the insula, which is right in there. And over the insula is a sulcus called the circular sulcus. I remember having an attending back when I was in fellowship who said this was their favorite sulcus. I don't know why. And like I said, why do people pick favorite brain parts? Um, but this was their favorite sulcus. Now the insula we really didn't know a whole lot about. Because if you think about it, it is covered up by the other lobes. And so prior to functional MRI, it was a little bit hard to investigate. Um, but we're beginning to know more and more about it. In fact, uh, one anatomist said that basically, or functional anatomist said that this is kind of the area of the brain that makes us human to a certain degree. It's involved in consciousness, emotion, perception, as you can see up there. But it's also involved in emotional feelings related to other people, like disgust or lust, that kind of thing. I mean, it kind of is interesting that it has sort of this uh, role. You, guilt is associated with this area, things like that. Also, compulsions or uh, control of compulsions, such as you're hungry and you want to grab something. It's that part of that brain that kind of inhibits you from eating everything. So it does play a role in that, but we are really starting to learn a lot more about it. So again, and you guys probably all remember this medical school, insula means like an island, because it's that little island of cortex. Now the primary olfactory cortex is going to involve the tip of the temporal lobe. And it has the piriform cortex and the periamygdaloid area. So you're going to have the medial area around the amygdala. And this was a patient, she was 28 years old, and this is a DNET, and she was having these weird smells. And usually these smells that are associated with this um, are typically bad. And you can have this kind of epilepsy where you have these abnormal smells arising from this area. The piriform cortex is involved uh, in smell. 
And it's, they describe it as a small region monster medial to the amygdala. It's kind of an area that's hard to pin down on just anatomic imaging. Uh, functional imaging, they've looked at it. It varies in people. If you're a pathologist, uh, you can actually, by histology, easily differentiate the area, but by imaging, it's kind of basically hard. Uh, not only do they have the piriform cortex, but some people will actually refer to it as the piriform lobe, um, and that will involve the amygdala and the perihippocampal gyrus. But the whole area is basically involved with olfaction. And within it, there's called something called the area timtestus. And it's called timtestuous, like timtestuous, that kind of thing. It's an area where, if it's irritated, seizure foci. So this is an area that's prone to seizure, that's sensitive to it. The seizures can be elicited if this area is stimulated. Okay. So the cortical motor areas, uh, again, remember the homunculus when you were back in medical school. This is a 70-year-old guy with right leg weakness. He's got an anterior cerebral uh, artery territory infarct. Nicely seen there. If you remember, the leg is in this location as far as that homunculus. So if you get an ACA infarct, you're going to have leg weakness. And again, in case you didn't remember, I'll show you the picture. So um, basically, if you hurt the primary motor cortex, this is why it's very important to surgeons, you're going to have a flaccid paralysis on the contralateral side. So they definitely want to know, again, that whole thing about finding the central sulcus. Here's a guy with left-sided weakness. I think you can tell why. This was a huge hemangioma. I'm not hemangioma, meningioma. Like I said, I'm a little bit uh, jet-lagged. But a large meningioma, he probably had some sensory issues too as well but he wound up with a left-sided weakness. The premotor area is basically anterior to the primary motor area, uh, just right in front of it. And basically, it does things like control sequential movements like walking. So if you damage this area, you're going to have difficulty actually putting the sequence of walking together. Um, this was a patient who had a hemorrhagic metastasis who actually found that they were not able to walk easily. That's what they presented with. And then we have the cortical language areas. This already touched a little bit on them. This is my uh, African gray. They're known for talking, so hence the, why they're, he's sitting there on the language area. His name is Lolani. People debate whether or not birds actually know what they're saying, but uh, he definitely parrots my husband calling my kids, but he has actually told me to stop it when I'm bothering him, so I think he has some idea. Um, most people... Um, is basically going, their language area is going to be in the left hemisphere despite being left or right hand. And the majority of people will be in the left hemisphere. And the components of the language area is going to be Wernicke's area, Broca's, the angular, and the supermarginal gyrus that I already touched on. Wernicke's area is involved in the comprehension of language. It's that area, like I mentioned already, along the posterior superior aspect of the temporal lobe. And this person had a metastatic adenocarcinoma. And they wound up with periodic confusion and difficulty with speech. So that's sitting right on the area of Wernicke's. And Wernicke's is that receptive aphasia is what we were taught in medical school. And basically, you have Heschel's gyrus, your primary auditory co uh, cortex. Spoken language is perceived there and transmitted to Wernicke's, where it's comprehended. Um, Broca's area is going to be along the inferior frontal gyrus. So again, we have that M, and Broca's is the posterior aspect of the M. The other thing about the inferior frontal gyrus, um, it does kind of controls, so it's like go or no-go behavior. So if you damage it, you wind up having people who have risky behaviors, kind of like teenagers. Um, so that, that's part of the control for that. And again, the three parts. Broca's damage is an inability to express oneself via speech or an expressive aphasia. Uh, I used to have a hard time getting some of my med students to be able to keep it together, like Broca's versus Wernicke, expressive versus receptive. So I finally came, Broca sounds like broken. So I would use this picture of Grandpa Simpson with his broken dentures, and he couldn't speak. I actually found that actually helped some of them to remember that Broca's was an expressive aphasia, strangely enough. And this is a meningioma. It's just happening to push in on Broca's area. The patient did have difficulty with speech. Notice it is on the left-hand side. And this meningioma did happen to have a little arachnoid cyst associated with it. Okay. Memory, I'm just going to only lightly touch on this. This could be an hour-long plus, um, <laughs> could probably be a whole series of uh, lectures. 
but just to touch on a few of them, the parahippocampal gyrus is going to be that gyrus right underneath the hippocampus. And it's kind of interesting in that it does encoding and recognition of environmental scenes. So I tend to get homesick from my place in Hawaii, so this is my view off my back balcony. And if I had damage to my parahippocampal gyrus, I would not be able to tell you that is my view off the balcony. Interestingly enough, though, I would be able to tell you the things in the view, like I would be able to say that's a lamppost, but I would not be able to recognize it or tell you where it is. Other areas involved in memory include the hippocampus, the cingulate gyrus, and the amygdala. Uh, the hippocampus is involved in memory consolidation, and if you have damage to it, you wind up with antigrade amnesia. And this is a patient with mesotemporal sclerosis, and these patients do have problems with memory. And they may not even have developed it to the point where you have the abnormal signal in the hippocampus. In this case, you could see it's got abnormal, oops, sorry. How do I get back? There we go. So it's got abnormal signal. It actually is, though hard to tell on this, smaller than the other side. Um, and this patient did have memory problems in addition to their seizures. Also, because the temporal lobes when you're dealing with patients with dementia, and especially with Alzheimer's, they have come up with a grading scale for it, the medial temporal lobe atrophy score for dementia. And it depends on the degree of loss of volume in the hippocampus, the widening of the choroidal fissure. And in this case, you can see this is a four, how wide the temporal or how large the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle are, and how small the hippocampus is. And then the amygdala, we've touched on already, sort of that almond shape, and that's why the almond is up there, involves emotional learning and memory, especially things related to fear and anger. It seems to be strongly uh, a part of that. So anyway, in conclusions, like I said, I kind of had a whirlwind tour of the cortical anatomy. Hopefully it gives you a little idea of what some of these areas are involved in, little ways of identifying them. This is my dog. He's not the world's smartest dog. Uh, my son dropped him on his head when he was a puppy, so I don't know if that's part of it. But in his fur, there's a feather from my African gray. He didn't harm the African gray. In fact, the African gray owns him <laughs> and will bite his nose if he comes anywhere near him. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to email me. And next will be Dr. Solomon. Thank you, Alice. Great talk. So um, I'm, I'm Noriko Salomon from UCLA. Um, it's uh, almost 6 o'clock in LA time, so it's kind of early for me, but uh, we'll see. And then I'm going to talk about basal ganglia. Well, you may think, well, you know, this is 30 minutes talk. Who, who, what's she going to talk about 30 minutes for basal ganglia? There's like a few structures there. Well, watch me. Um, there are <laughs> many stuff you may not know, so I have no disclosures. So goal of this lecture is review structural anatomy and imaging characteristic of basal ganglia, and then you will know um, many stuff interesting happening in the basal ganglia, and then understand the function of basal ganglia and some clinical implications, and the, well, we're going to touch base on a little bit of vascular anatomy also. So three parts. Um, you know, people cannot really take so many informations. I know uh, that's, I, I'm, I'm like that too. So I would just, uh, based on three things, you have to know only three things. So this outline is just have to know what is basal ganglia, and then you have to know the function, and then the vascular anatomy. So, you know, most of the thing I'm going to base on is one and two. So what is basal ganglia? This is not a sum question. This is a dumb question, right? So which one is not basal ganglia? Well, you know the basal ganglia you, you learned in medical school is, you know, growth, ptamine growth, pytheus, and caudate. That's for sure, right? How about subthalamic nucleus? Well, people are gonna say, I don't know where it is, right? Salamus, well, sounds like a basal ganglia, but it's not really the basal ganglia. That's what the answer is. Substantial nigra is like in the brainstem, it's not, it's not really the area of basal ganglia, but you know, substantial nigra is basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia includes striatum, which is caudate and ptamen, 
and globe spiders, subthalamic nucleus and subthalamic nigra. Those are the four major structures I'm going to show and talk about. Right? So striatum has two distinct parts. So caudate and putamen. If you look at the MRI, you can see here the caudate and putamen has the same signal intensity because they are brothers or sisters, right? And different from globe spiders. So that's how it's easy to kind of remember. And the caudate have head and body and tail like hippocampus. The putamen is uh, located between external capsule and internal capsule. See, you can see the external capsule and the internal capsule here, right? And then you can see nicely the, the putamen is relatively huge. You, and Alice talked about the insula. The, wherever insula goes, putamen goes, right? So it's a large area of the basal ganglia. So you, you never saw the striatum or uh, you know, basal ganglia in sagittal plane, but sagittal plane is kind of useful. If you cut a little more medially, you can see the caudate uh, head to body nicely in the anterior posterior direction. And the ptamen goes uh, anterior half of this inferior aspect. And then you have internal capsule and the posterior you can see the thumbs. And then it's more laterally, you can see the large area, which is, if you go a little bit more laterally, you can see the insula here. And then medial to the insula, that's where the ptamen rides. The caudate body, is you can see it in anterior posteriority, and then you see it in axial, it's lateral to the lateral ventricle. So um, if you have a periventricular high intensity, not only that's a MS in the white matter, there are some caudate component in, into it. So you have a si tiny infarction in the caudate body. You may see it looks like a periventricular thing. The caudate tail is a hard thing. Caudate tail is very small and then hanging out in the lateral to the temporal horn or lateral ventricle. So you see it here in this gray metal structure. I'll zoom it for you for your picture. So, <laughs> and then you can see the hippocampus here and then lateral superior aspect in gray structure. This is not a heterotopia. This is a caudate tail. So don't take this out. Right, so that's that's normal structure. Everybody, or we all have. If you see as something gray matter structure in the lateral aspect or inferior aspect of the temporal horn lateral ventricle, that's going to be the heterotopia. Okay, that's good to know. Caudate tail is vascularized by anterior corridor artery. I'm going to talk about you later. But caudate tail infarction can be very tricky. Um, you know, anterior cordial artery can be infected in many ways in, if you have ICA occlusion. And then you can see the very tiny spot, lateral to the atrium lateral ventricle in DWI, that may be a caudate tail infarction. So um, the anterior, the striatum, this is people uh, ignore, but this is the fun stuff. So if you go very frontal portion of the coronal view, you can see the caudate head and ptamen is meeting together. You see, so there's a contiguous structure here which called accumbens nucleus. So accumbens nucleus right here or here is very ventral aspect and this is a center of pleasure or rewarding. And then this is projected the ventral pallidum and there also median nucleus alamus to the prefrontal cortex which Alice just talked about, about executive uh, the function and cognition, etc. So this is where the action site of cocaine and amphetamine, all good stuff goes, you see? So the uncommon <laughs> nucleus is increasing dopamine level. So that's how you, you, you like it, right? So this is the area of the target sometimes putting a deep brain stimulator to treat depression. So if you wanna go have fun, you think about the accumbens nucleus, which is located in frontal portion and in between the joining portion of the caudate and ptamen, right? So this person came with a infarction here. And then if you see this in signal abnormality in the flare, it's uh, you ha kind of hard, difficult to dis explain where exactly this is, because this is not in the ptamen, this is not the globus spiders, it's kind of, caudate, but it's very inferior. So eventually this is right here, and 
this patient had a accumbens nucleus infarction. In the acute phase, this person was out of control. He's having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. So um, then, yeah, that was, it happens, you know, that's so, so, you know, the next time you saw in this location, that's, you, you, you should check out the patient. <laughs> Globe spiders is divided in internal and external portion. You can see the little lamina, medullary lamina here in between, and the next one is internal. And then, so you can see the smaller structure, medial to the ptamen. And usually this is where the lots of uh, accumulation of the ion, accumulation of manganese, uh, et cetera, happens. So you can see the signal intensity is a little bit different. And then also you can see the calcium deposition. So that's how you can easily recognize compared to the other structures. Well, the globus spiders has more. Well, you will, you will not like globus spiders um, if you're talking about uh, functions, but globus spiders receives from the information, the pertainment, and then they send it to the thalamus. So there are lots of fibers going through you may not realize, through the uh, internal of the globus spiders, through these pathways, which called field of follow H1 and H2, that's paridothalamic fibers, crossing the internal capsule, you can see it here. This is the internal capsule, and then the globus spiders is located lateral to the internal capsule. Thalamus is medial to the internal capsule, so they somehow have to cross it. So. Interestingly enough, if you look at the, here is the thalamus and then globus spiders, the lateral to it, in the internal capsule. Internal capsule is uh, descending fibers, descending ascending fibers. So you see in DTI is a blue fibers, right? But you can see that this red stuff traversing, this is what you're capturing this globus spiders to the thalamic fibers. Okay, now I have to talk about the claustrum. Crostrum is nobody cares about the crostrum. Crostrum, you know, the ex <laughs> external capsule portion have a gray matter structures, very thin layer of gray matter structures here. Crostrum means hidden away. So this is a very thin strip of gray matter between ptamen and the insular cortex, which nobody cares, right? Um, but eventually, um, the function MRI and many animal studies and found out this is very interesting stuff here. It receives projection from the lateral hypothalamus, central median thalamic nucleus and locus series, which doesn't mean anything to you, but you know, <laughs> this is, eventually the claustrum is like an orchestra uh, conductor. So he knows everything, but he doesn't really play. So that's why you don't really think appearing, but you know, I'm gonna say this is like in your, at your work, you have a guy who don't say anything and very quiet. And it's, it doesn't really, nobody recognize him, but eventually he knows everybody's password or something, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> Scary thing. So that's Crossroom. So watch out Crossroom. So eventually people think this is where the consciousness is uh, arising from. So it's very connect, well connected. And then some people who did a uh, structure imaging is analysis for the Crossroom and then, um, Wherever insular goes, ptamen goes, but also crostrum goes too. So the crostrum is kind of um, medial to the insular, this kind of very flat, uh, broad, thin structures. And the, I think in the fut near future, this is going to be a center of interesting cognitive um, research subject. Now, subthalamic nucleus is also called cord of Lewis, and then this is the cells are similar to substantial nigra in you know, globus pyridus. This is located inferior to the thalamus. That's why name comes subthalamic nucleus, medial to the internal capsule, right? So there is not, so lateral to the internal capsule, you have globus pyridus, so there is not so much space there. So, you know, this is medial to the internal capsule. And then superior to the uh, substantial nigra, lateral to the red nucleus. So this is a very small, space between red nucleus and substantial nigra and the inferior to thalamus, that's where the subthalamic sub nucleus lives. The people put a DBS here, deep brain stimulator here, to control the, the, the tremor, etc. So 
it's maybe good to know as a radiologist where the subatomic nucleus is, right? Subsuncture Niagara has pulse compactor and pulse reticulata. Um, so you can see that compactor and reticulata has a, a little bit different uh, component in ion deposition here. Here's the red nucleus. And the, this is where the pulse compactor is the dotam, do, dopaminergic neurons lives. And then this is where the Parkinson disease uh, is originated from. Now, those are the anatomical structures. Right, and then so then it's important to know what kind of function basal ganglia has because you know we, we know where those things are, but if you don't know the functions, there's not, nothing really interesting. So, the basal ganglia is you can see they're located in the central portion of the brain, and the brain cortex we just learned has a many many functions. Eventually, as you know, the basal ganglia controls the motor function first, and then so the frontal lobe precentral gyrus, prefrontal cortex, etc. All this information comes to the striatum, caudate, and ptamen, and then go to the globus pilus. Globus pilus carry the information to the thalamus, and the thalamus going back to the frontal lobe. So that's, that's how the motion is regulated and executed, right? The projection of the striatum, ptamen, caudate, is have a different uh, uh, sort of distribution to the cortex. So the most of the ptamen thing goes to precentral gyrus and prefrontal cortex. And then caudate thing is go to the more to the anterior portion of prefrontal cortex, more executive, um, more emotional con content. So that means uh, basal ganglia not only control motor functions, but also some executive prefrontal functions. So just Again, there's three things you have to remember in the function. There is a motor, motivation, or executive functions, and memory, right? So you may not never thought of basal ganglia as related to the memory, but there are ventral pathway of the basal ganglia, including accumbens nucleus. That's fun stuff. That is more emotion and then memory uh, pathway through of, of the basal ganglia thing. So this is called the limbic basal ganglia, and this is associative basal ganglia, this is a motor group of the basal ganglia. So those are three functions basal ganglia has. Um, the, the thalamic relay of basal ganglia, you have a mostly ventral anterior nuclear thalamus, ventral lateral nuclear thalamus, and dorsal median nuclear thalamus. Those are the three things associated to the motor and limbic system of the frontal connection. You remember the HIE kid, if you, the kid has a, a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, you have a posterior ptamen and ventral nuclei of the thalamus has a uh, the injury there. So you know why? Because the, the babies, you have motor function is going to develop. So there is a lot of met hypermetabolism going into these um, motor function areas. So that's why the the location related to those development is the one who's been affected, for example. Now, uh, the motor function, uh, you may heard of double inhibitory theory, so which is a, you know, this is like a neurology stuff, and then I don't have to learn about this. But it's, it's important to remember, then you can, you have some implication to it. So, this is how it goes, the hierarchy of the basal ganglia to the brain. So uh, thalamus is, the f uh, is you, okay? So, and then thalamus is a friend of cortex, okay? So thalamus is like a small part, part of the brain, et cetera, but you know, say you wanna go out with your friend Jim and Tim to go out to, for a drink, right? Well. In your life, always somebody who just uh, uh, suppresses you, right? So inhib inhibitory process. Either your wife or, <laughs> or a girlfriend or mother or somebody, right? So the global spiders is a bad person, you see? So they said, no, I, I, so I want to go out for beer. And so your wife is going to say, are you kidding me? So what are you talking about? So this is uh, inhibitory process. And then maybe in real life, you have nobody gonna suppress your wife, but in the brain system, <laughs> luckily, there somebody says no to your wife, 
right? So that's the, you know, striatum. Striatum has much higher, fu you know, function hierarchy. So that say suppresses you. So, you know, eventually you can go out. That's how, <laughs> that's how you have a normal movement, right? So this is a normal situation. Well, unfortunately, the Parkinson disease, there's nobody suppresses your wife. So you may never thought about your Parkinson, but you, your situation is in the Parkinson disease. So <laughs> you wanna go out for a drink, but you said no, and then so you're not gonna go out, right? So that's how the, the motor function is decreased or poorly controlled, so causing tremor everything. So that's why if you really want to regulate that problem, um, they're gonna put the electrode to the globus spiders. Many treatment is done through the subthalamic nucleus. So the, what the subthalamic nucleus does is, subthalamic nucleus is like your wife's friend, right? So your wife's friend is your enemy too. So <laughs> <laughs> he said, why you have to go out? You should stay home and helping your, your, your wife, right? So it's, you know, this is like none of your business, but that's the, the business of subthalamic nucleus. So subthalamic nucleus sort of, you know, Exciting, exciting stuff. So you know, sometimes the nucleus is just uh, saying to your wife that just you shouldn't let him go, right? And then you know, and then in the same time, they just bothers you too, right? So, but luckily, this ptamen caudate is just to say no, no, no. You just you back off. You let 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 him go. So you can go out to drink, right? But in the Parkinson disease that person is not there. So your wife's friend and your wife both says, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't go, you, st you stay home and then, you know, do, do washes or something, right? So, <laughs> so that's the situation. Okay, so now you know how the, you know, basal ganglia functions and you can relate to yourself. And then, you know, the global spiders, you, if you have a, Carbon monoxide, they can, you can kill global spiders, but don't even think about your, your <laughs> wife. Anyway, so, <laughs> uh, limbic function. So there's another, another function, important function, is a limbic uh, basal ganglia. So there's a ventral portion of the global spiders, meaning you can see the uh, uh, ptamen and global spiders go underneath this anterior commissure. This is a, a frontal uh, slice. Underneath the in, in, an anterior commissure, this component of the globus pardus, the limbic functions. Also, you can see underneath the anterior commissure, the big nuclei called nucleus basalis or minor, which is uh, closely related to Alzheimer's disease. And then, so if you see the lesion or atrophy on those areas, those people may have some memory problems. And then, ventral tegmental area is anterior to the red nucleus, medial to the substantial nigra, this small space is uh, also closely related to the accumbens nucleus. So this is highly dopaminergic. Also, this is, those are the two areas where the most of the drugs works, right? So um, the, this is a, a very interesting area for the research in ADHD and in all these drug uh, addiction related uh, brain functions. So that if you make a basal ganglia functional map, um, you see the ptamen is mostly, lateral ptamen is mostly motor, ventral globus pardus is limbic, and then the um, uh, cumbus nucleus is limbic, and then the rest of the caudate and then the more anterior inferior portion of the globus pardus, those are associative, which is mostly projecting to the prefrontal cortex and executive functions, etc. Just, just a short uh, stuff for the vascular anatomy of basal ganglia. So um, it's important to know the vascular anatomy. So there are three things can go. Uh, the ACA branch, fibrinal artery, they go to the head of the caudate. MCA, perforators, of course, you know, that go to the to the caudate body. And anterior cordial artery goes to the caudate tail, right? So, and then anterior cordial artery also goes to substantial nigra and then brainstem portion of the, um, the basal ganglia. 
Okay, so that's the, the three vascular territories. So recurrent arterial humor is the, this uh, a German pediatrician found this in 1872. And this artery arises from proximal A1 or A2 segment of the anterior cerebral artery. So the curves are around and then go to the anterior caudate head, anterior putamen. So these are the areas which anterior inferior portion of the, uh, the stereotomy vascularization, and also goes to the anterior rim of the internal capsule, right? Anterior choroidal artery is the more posterior portion of the vascular artery. Anterior choroidal artery likes to go to many, many other areas, which is a very favorite both question. Um, but you can see the substantial nigra, tail of the caudate, and posterior inferior putamen. If you see those areas involved in the acute infarction, you have to think anterior choroidal artery being occluded. Right, and then the uh, MCA perforators. If you look at this M1 segment, this M1 segment, the um, the more lateral they go, you can see the longer the perforator is. So you, this perforator goes through the lateral abdomen and then traversing the internal capsule and then goes to the caudate body, right? So that's called the ventricular straight artery, and. And then the, this is actual plane integral serrated artery. You can see the pertainment to the caudate. This goes contiguous um, vascularization there. And then you can see in sagittal view as well, you can see most of the ventricular serrated artery covers the large portion of the caudate and the pertainment. So um, that's the vascular map, ACA. Um, Humana goes here, MCA goes there, and then anterior cord artery goes to the caudate tail and then posterior abdomen. So that's pretty straightforward and, and simple, right? Um, so the summary, the basal ganglia includes stratum, globus pridus, some social nigra, and some samic nuclei, and crostrum. Just remember the, um, you know, where the caudate tail is where the ventral tegmental area is, and then accumbens nucleus, those are the dopaminergic, and then that's what the uh, you know, drug works. Three major functions, motor, but also associated with limbic, and then perforators from MC and artery humanoid, and then the recorded arteries are major feeding arteries. So for that, um, I finished the basal ganglia talk. Thank you for your attention. Can I have my presentation, please? So I'm uh, Manu Shroff. I'm from Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, University of Toronto. I hope you all have, are having a great time over here in Toronto. Unfortunately, the weather is not so great. So this is really an important session, and I can see how important it is with a full house. We had two fabulous talks, and I wish that I wasn't speaking here and listening to Dr. Solomon and Dr. Smith. I don't think I can match their wit and humor, but let's try. <laughs> so I'm gonna speak on white matter anatomy, and I think uh, if you look at neurology, the simple link of injury and outcome to, to any disease is uh, the location of the anatomy of the disease. And hence, it's important to look at brain anatomy in great detail, particularly for any neurology-related problem. We're going to look at white matter anatomy uh, using some conventional MR images. Uh, qualitative DTI, I'm mentioning qualitative, not any quantitative aspects, because I find that very confusing. And I'll show a few clinical examples, because it's supposed to be normal anatomy. Most of the images I've used are from this chapter that we wrote in the neuroimaging clinics. And I also use some images from the Elsevier DTI Atlas, which is a fabulous resource to use if you want to learn white matter anatomy. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, before we go on, we should know that myelination makes an impact on what the white matter looks like on T1 and T2 images. Initially, at term, uh, white matter, when it is not myelinated, is hypo-intense. And then when it matures completely, it turns bright on T1 images. Similarly, on T2 images, it is bright because there is a lot of water content when it's not myelinated. And then when it gets completely myelinated, it turns dark on T2-weighted images. One should also know that uh, the appearance of T1 and T2 images 
as regard to myelination is different. Myelination appears first on T1 images and lags on the T2 images. This is at six months, and you can see that. This is myelinated white matter. On T2, it looks like it's not myelinated. Similarly, at nine months. So basically, by about one year, you have almost complete myelination of the white matter. And for T2 weighted images, you usually have hypo-intensity of the white matter or almost complete myelination by two to two and a half years. So these are some basic facts that we should know. Also know that myelination adds bulk, and I've seen trainees and even some staff radiologists who don't do neuroradiology on a regular basis that they would report a hypoplastic corpus callosum at term or in a child who's two to three months old, but the corpus callosum develops its full shape almost at six to seven months. So make sure that you understand that myelination also adds bulk to the white matter. Another important thing, and I think this is something which we all know very, very well, is the terminal zones of myelination in the peritrigonal white matter. And these can appear bright. Usually they are similar to gray matter, sometimes brighter than gray matter if there are perivascular spaces. And these are just uh, the last areas of myelination that occur. So these are normal areas. When you just do routine MR, uh, you can see a lot of white matter tracks. And particularly if you have a younger teenager or a young adult and you have a high Tesla magnet that you're using, you can see nicely some white matter tracks, for example, these flare images in this young patient shows mild hyperintensity of the corticospinal tracts as they go down into the <coughs> posterior limb of the internal capsule and then in the cerebral crust. Of course, this is a little challenging as you get older, and then we have uh, color-coded fractional anisotropy maps on DTI, which help us a lot. For example, this blue correlates with this motor tract, the corona radiata, and the corticospinal tract. You can also identify certain specific neuroanatomical areas on higher resolution T1 images, which we all get on a 3D T1 now, usually one millimeter or sub millimeter scans. And you can see this is the anterior commissure in the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. You can see this is the fornix and the hippocampal commissure. This is where they come together. And then you can see the singular uh, cingulum, which is just beneath the cingulate gyrus. And I'll show you more details of this as we go through uh, some of the qualitative DTI FA maps. Now, on this SAGE T1 images, you can identify parts of the mammalothalamic tract, which is an interesting tract, also plays a big role in memory. I think all midline structures play a big role in memory. And this connects uh, fibers of the fornix from here and from the mammary body to nuclei in the thalamus, I think the medial and the lateral nuclei. So you can... Uh, grossly characterize white matter by its depth, by location, or in specific anatomic areas. And this is something that we do in a routine, standard way when we report our MRs. But I think it's better to classify white matter with the connections it keeps. We all are known by the connections that we keep, right? So why not do that for the white matter? So projection fibers, these are fibers which project far distally from the cortical areas into the spinal cord, brainstem, cerebellum, deep gray nuclei. Association fibers are fibers which connect different cortical areas within the same hemisphere. Classic examples are the cingulum and the SLF, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, and then the commissural fibers which connect similar cortical areas across the two hemispheres, and the corpus callosum is a great example for that. I, I picked up this, uh, this image from this particular uh, book, and it reminded me of my medical school days uh, in the early 80s when we used to attend uh, anatomy classes for one and a half years, sit through classes where professors would of, often smoke. My anatomy professor was a brilliant chap, neuroanatomy professor, who would smoke 20 cigarettes in the one and a half hour lecture that he used to give us <laughs> in a closed room, and we would smoke 10 cigarettes with him passively. <laughs> But he was brilliant at this. But for him to show us his anatomy, somebody had to die, number one. Then they had to take out his brain, freeze it, and well, put it in formalin for three weeks, 10% formalin, and it used to smell horrible. We often got it on your clothes. And then you had to freeze it for another two to three weeks at minus 15 degrees centigrade. And then you had to carefully dissect it out, otherwise you wouldn't see white matter anatomy. Brain is all mushy. Fortunately, today, no one has to die, and you can get the same anatomy just in vivo with a push of a button on an MR scan. So that's what we're going to see. <clears throat>
And the beauty of uh, how we do that today is using diffusion tensor imaging, which uses anisotropic directional information that we can use to identify major white matter tracks. So using the directional color-coded FA maps, which are very readily available at a push of a button, you can identify some of the tracks. And this color coding is conventionally based, is the blue, red, green. And it took me a long time to memorize what blue means and what red means, but it's very simple. Let me explain it to you. You know, in Canada, we often dream of a blue sky. So you look up, and that's up and down. So if a fiber is running up and down the corticospinal tract, that is blue. In Canada, when you have a red light, you often have a free right turn. You don't have to wait for it to go green. So right to left is red. And then green is anterior posterior. When you have a green light, you can go forward, right? So that's a simple way to remember it. The superior longitudinal fasciculus is anterior posteriorly oriented. That's green. The corpus callosum is from side to side, so that is red. And the corticospinal tracts is blue because this is from up to down. So a very simple way of remembering that. With that, let's go on to certain examples of these different broad categories of uh, fibers that we just described. So we'll come to the projection fibers. And the corticospinal tract is a great example of a projection fiber. And you can see it over here. It's in the posterior limb of the internal capsule right over here. It goes up from the cortical areas, which were so beautifully described by Dr. Smith, down into the brainstem and the spinal cord. And, and as it goes into the, into the internal capsule and into the medulla, you can see the blue structures over here. So I'm not supposed to put up some questions. It's a mistake. I, you know, uh, last night I thought I read that I had to do it, so I had to change my talk and load it again today. So ignore the Sam question, <laughs> OK, as to what it says. But you had to do it online to get your points. So please ignore this. <laughs> so, so the internal capsule is a very important structure because this is a broad, this is a pipeline through which a lot of white matter tracks go into the brainstem and then into the spinal cord. And if you look at the corticospinal tract, which is what we were thinking of, it lies in the middle portion of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And this internal capsule is bound by gray matter structures, which were so nicely described by Dr. Solomon. The internal capsule has a lot of fibers, and more than the corticospinal tract, there's a lot of thalamic radiation and various other things that go along with it. For example, this is the lateral geniculate body, and the geniculocalcarine portion of the optic radiation arises is right at the posterior edge of the posterior limb of the internal capsule. And all this can be beautifully seen if you just use color-coded FA maps. So this, this is from the atlas, but you can actually do it in any patient currently on a modern magnet. It takes about five to six minutes to get a nice DTI image and to color code it. You don't have to really post process it. It's automatic. So if you follow the corticospinal tract down into the brainstem and the cord, you can see that it has a specific topographic arrangement for example, in this area, the anterior fibers belong to the face and the posterior fibers belong to the lower limb. But as they come down to the middle third of the crust, the medial fibers represent the face, the lateral fibers are feet, and in between are the hand fibers. What is very important with the corticospinal tract is as it descends down into the medulla, most of the fibers, 75 to 90% decussate, and a very small percentage remain on the same side. And that's why when you have an injury to the corticospinal tract, you often have contralateral symptoms. So there are some variations, but these are really the most common thing is that a few percentage of the fibers will not decussate and will remain on the same side. Very rarely, very, very rarely, and this is a very rare example, I think this is the only one I have seen in my experience, uh, contributed by a good friend of mine, a neuroradiologist from India, where this, this patient had an infarct on the right side and had the motor deficit on the same side. And as DTI showed that the corticospinal tracts were remaining mostly on the same side going down into the cord. Usually this sort of uh, uncrossed pyramidal tracts occurs in this syndrome of horizontal gaze palsy and scoliosis, which this patient did not have. So this was a very, very rare variation. With that, let's come to the optic radiation. And like I told you, we'll focus more on the geniculocalcarine tract, which is fibers of the optic radiation running from the lateral geniculate body to the visual cortex. And in this, let's pay attention to the Meyer's loop, which is the anterior portion of this geniculocalcarine tract. And this Meyer's loop is very important because it extends fairly anteriorly, almost up to the tip of the temporal horn. 
And if you speak to any neurosurgeon operating in this area, they always want to consider as to where the Mayer's loop comes in, because if you injure it, then this is what you get, homonymous upper quadrantopenopia. With that, let's come to association fibers and show you some examples of those. I'll talk a little bit about the cingulum, the fornix, and the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So the cingulum, as we know, are fibers which arise from beneath the genu, sorry, beneath the rostrum of the corpus callosum. Then they swing around the, and arch over the corpus callosum. So you can see this is a coronal image showing you the green anterior posteriorly oriented cingulum. And then as they come down, they go laterally into the parahippocampal gyrus and the uncus. And this is part of the cingulum, the inferior portion right over here. This is an image which I took in the midline and a lateral image of the temporal lobe and I've superimposed it. So don't, go, don't get confused with the sagittal image. It's a medium, medial image and a temporal lobe image put together. You can also see the cingulum very well on axial images and here it is, anterior posterior. We said it's green and that's what it is. And sometimes people, instead of using full color, can take just T1 images and you know, overlay it on gray matters, uh, on, on spin echo images to see the anatomy much better. So that's the cingulum over here. The phonics is another important area, it has to do a lot with memory. So just for the residents, if you have any issues with memory on your clinical scans that you're doing, always look at the cingulum, the mammalothalamic tract, and all the midline structures, the limbic system carefully. So the phonics is similar in shape to the cingulum. It has a column, a body, and a crust. And it's an important part of the circuit of PAPE, which plays a very important role in the hippocampal limbic system and memory. And actually, this is a very beautiful article on the phonics and radiographics. So if you need more detail, please refer to this. It connects the mammary body and the, and the hippocampus with the phonics anterior to posteriorly in that sort of direction. So again, I'm sorry, I didn't want to put in this question. I, I was not thinking when I read that I did not have to put some questions. And actually, I confused the two speakers over here today morning. But here it is, and don't look at it, ignore it. <laughs> Answer it online. So we'll go on to the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which as we just read in the same question, is the largest association fasciculus. It is a bidirectional fiber, so it conveys information to and fro from the frontal to the parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. It has many components, and I find this very confusion, uh, confusing, so we won't go into great details, but this is the SLF, and it has these functions. So some of these uh, white matter tracts which connect important areas are known as eloquent white matter tracts. This is a coronal image which shows you nicely the various uh, correlations and associations of the association fibers and the commissures. For example, the cingulum is just medial to the corpus callosum over here, this is the superior occipital frontal uh, fasciculus, which is between the corpus callosum and the anterior limb of the internal capsule. The superior longitudinal fasciculus is just at the superior aspect of the claustrum. And then this is the temporal stem area, which is the inferior occipital frontal fasciculus and the uncinate fasciculus. And we'll come to some more details of these. Just an important point when you're looking at coronal images, you can nicely identify the superior longitudinal fasciculus is lateral to the corticospinal tracts, which are blue, going superior inferiorly, and often forms a nice triangle at the level of the brainstem and posteriorly to identify it very well. So the arcuate fasciculus is a very important component. Uh, some, wanted, some anatomists want to describe it as a separate fasciculus. Some put it as part of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Whatever it is called the arcuate fasciculus, and is important in language, it connects Broca's with Wernicke's. And this is uh, one of my fellows, Prakash Muthuswamy, who did this. He's doing a project where we see that, depending on the dominant hemisphere, the fiber density is much larger for the arcuate fasciculus on that side. So these are the other trajectories of the uh, SLF goes like this. The inferior longitudinal fasciculus goes like this. And we won't talk a lot about it. But this is an important one, uncinate fasciculus. And very interesting because it connects the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe. And we had a patient about three years or four years back where there was a very tiny tumor sitting in the frontal lobe, and the patient had classic temporal lobe epilepsy. And in fact, we wrote a paper on that because the epilepsy was propagating through this uncinate fasciculus into the temporal lobe, and that is what it was showing on all neurophysiologic studies. 
So it's important to understand these relations and these projections to understand how patients might present. The temporal stem is an important anatomic area, and, and um, a lot of fibers and tracts go through with the uncinate fasciculus, the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, and a part of the optic radiation, the Myers loop. And one has to always consider this area when there's disease in this area. And, and this is a nice line diagram showing you the relationship of the different things. So this, U, this blue thing is the uncinate fasciculus connecting the frontal to the temporal lobe. The red thing is the inferior occipital fasciculus, and this is the Myers loop, which comes almost to the tip of the temporal horn to show you the relationship of the different tracts in the temporal stem. This is just to show you a tumor extending into the temporal stem, and it is said that if you have extension of an infiltrating tumor into the temporal stem, then it can propagate into the other areas of the brain via the different tracts that go through that particular area. It's very much like the pterygopalatine fossa, which is a gateway to other areas of the compartments of the neck. So we come to commissural fibers, and these are fibers which connect similar cortical areas in the two hemispheres. And the big ones are the corpus callosum and the anterior commissure. So the corpus callosum uh, is a very large structure, as we all know, going anterior posteriorly. In its body region, it, the fibers are transversely oriented and they're red in color. And in the genu and the splenium, these fibers arch anteriorly and posteriorly. So you'll have the forceps minor anteriorly and the forceps major posteriorly. And then we have this structure. So this is the, this is the splenium of the corpus callosum in the coronal plane. We have these uh, fibers which project towards the temporal lobe inferiorly from the splenium of the corpus callosum. And this is known as a tapetum. So this is, this is the forceps major, and this is the tapetal fibers going towards the temporal lobe. So just to show you uh, that you know, normally we have commissures which go across, and sometimes we have aberrant white matter tracts, and these could be important. So this is a case of hemimegalencephaly, obvious abnormality. A young child who had frequent epilepsy uh, and and then had to have a hemispherectomy, which often is indicated for these patients. In this particular patient, I'm not showing you the post-operative images, but after a hemispherectomy, uh, there were new seizures which came up from the left side, and they were wondering what has happened. Then they realized on a post-op image, and let me show you this, and we had not described this pre-operatively, but we, we sort of went back and looked at it. There was a white matter bundle crossing over to the other side, and it was an aberrant white matter tract which was propagating epilepsy from residual areas of abnormality to the normal hemisphere. They went back in and cut this, and then the patient improved. And uh, this is now well described, actually, and if you want to read more about it, this is a very nice paper on it. There are about 14 or 15 cases, and 50% of cases of hemimegalencephaly have these aberrant white matter tracts. So it's important to know these tracts, and these are DTI images from this particular patient of ours. It shows you this aberrant white matter tract running anterior posteriorly from the right hemisphere, abnormal right hemisphere, into the normal left hemisphere. So very important to know these sort of white matter tracts. So we come to the brainstem, which will be the last few uh, slides that I'm going to show you. The brainstem is very interesting. And you know, when we started getting DTI color-coded maps, you realized how complex the anatomy or how interesting the anatomy was over here. And this is an axial color-coded FA map. You can see the corticospinal tracts very well. You can see the laminar sky, which go up and down. So that's blue. Corticospinal tracts is blue. The transversely oriented fibers are the ventral pontine tracts and the dorsal pontine tracts. This is a superior cerebellar peduncle, and these are parts of the middle cerebellar peduncle fibers, which become the transverse pontine anterior fibers. And these are actually uh, nice tractography images uh, from a good friend of mine, Sandeep Bhuta, who works along the, along the Golden Coast in Australia. And I don't know how he produces these images, but he seems to do some magic with this, and they really look very beautiful. And he tells me that this is just a regular uh, DTI acquisition. I don't believe him, honestly. So we come to more detail of the brainstem tracts, but here is what I want you to focus on is this particular structure. This is the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. And this is very interesting. And you can see that if you were to look at the fibers in the, on the brainstem, 
with some one simple push of a button, you can very nicely describe the white anatomy of the brainstem. This will be the corticospinal tracts over here. This will be the dorsal pontine fibers, the ventral pontine fibers, and this will be the medial lemon sky posteriorly. So if you look at this superior cerebellar peduncle, uh, this is thought to be the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle known as a red dot sign. And just so that you remember it well, show you a nice right dot over here. And this is uh, some more anatomy with fine detail. This is again from Sandeep Bhuta who gave me this nice image. These are the images that I made, not so good looking, but he seems to do some more post-processing which makes it look better. So again, the ventral pontine fibers, the dorsal pontine fibers, the corticospinal tracts, and the lemon sky going up and down, superior inferiorly, that's why it's blue. And these are the, this is the middle cerebellar peduncle coming in. And this is all becomes important in posterior fossa anomalies, congenital anomalies. And the classic example of that is the Jubate syndrome, where you can see this classic molar tooth sign. And this is the superior cerebellar peduncle, which instead of going superior inferiorly in a slanting way is more anterior posteriorly oriented, and that's why it looks like the roots of a tooth. And this is the superior cerebellar peduncle, the fibers oriented anterior posteriorly. And if you look at the differences, and this again from my friend Sandeep Bhuta, this is normal, and you can see that many of the fibers are hypoplastic or abnormal in the brainstem when you have congenital posterior fossa abnormalities involving the cerebellum or the brainstem. And also what happens, which is well described, is you have very poor decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle because of the way it's oriented, and you have the hypoplastic or an absent red dot. And that's why I wanted to show you the red dot on those normal brainstem images. So just to end and summarize, uh, depiction of major white matter tracts is easy and available at a push of a button. And any radiologist who reports brain MR should make an effort to apply this knowledge to routine reporting. It's fairly easy, simple, and straightforward. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you're enjoying Toronto. I suppose we have five minutes for questions, if there are any. Thank you. Well, now I have your attention. Thank you all for coming. I know, it's the last session of the day. It's very difficult to keep your attention on. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the Neuroradiology Case-Based Review Session. We have an excellent set of speakers for this afternoon. Uh, can I have my first slide, please? My name is Sumit Pruthi. I'm from Vanderbilt Hospital in Tennessee. I'm going to talk about diffusion tensor imaging. I have nothing to disclose. I want to thank Seth Smith, a good friend of mine, who uh, gave me some clear physics slides and illustration slides for this talk. In the next 15 minutes, my educational objective will be to give a very broad and brief overview of the technical aspects of DTI. Then I'm going to talk about some potential clinical use of DTI, followed by a brief discussion of the issues we face in interpreting DTI into a day-to-day -day basis. So the process of diffusion is based on the thermal, thermal Brownian motion, which is random motion of water molecules due to its thermal energy. Now this process can be compared to the evolution in the shape of a stain after an ink is dropped on a piece of paper. Very soon it turns to a circle which grows over time. Faster the diffusion, larger is the circle from which we can assess diffusion. To fully understand DTI, it's helpful to be familiar with basic principles of water diffusion in the brain and conceptual basis of DWI sequence. A DWI sequence starts with a spin echo sequence, which is also called the B0 sequence, where you have a 90-degree pulse. Then you have protons, which dephase. Then you have a 180-degree refocusing pulse, which refocuses the proton, leading to increased signal. In DWI sequence, we add two additional gradients, also called as diffusion sensitizing gradients, or motion probing gradients. The first gradient is applied before the 180 degree pulse, which introduces a phase shift in the molecule. Now the effect of this completely cancels out by the second gradient, which is of equal strength and is applied after the 180 degree pulse, only and only if the molecules in that voxel or slice are not moving, which means that there is restricted diffusion. So that, this, this lets the 180 degree pulse to refocus the protons, leading to high signal, which is seen in ischemia, 
or an infarction. A common term, common term used in diffusion is called the gradient strength or diffusion weighting, which is expressed as B value, which is nothing but the product of the square of the strength of this gradient and the timing interval between the two gradients. However, if the molecules diffuse to a new position between this and this gradient, they do not reach back to their initial state, and they experience a total phase shift, which leads to low signal, as seen in normal brain tissue. Now, in free diffusion, the displacement of water molecules, sorry, it's not working. The displacement, excuse me, the displacement of the water molecules can be divided as isotropic or anisotropic. Isotropic means it's equal in all direction, which means there is no preferred direction of the displacement of the water molecules. And this is seen in gray matter and CSF. And in DTI, this is represented with a sphere. As opposed to this, in white matter, the diffusion is anisotropic, which means that there's a preferred direction. So in white matter, there's more diffusion of the water molecules along the long axis of the axon as opposed to perpendicular to it, as seen in this illustration. And this, in a DTI language, is represented with an ellipsoid or a tubule. So what causes the anisotropy in white matter? The diffusion anisotropy in white matter is primarily caused by the cell membranes itself. There is some contribution and modulation of the anisotropy by the degree of myelination and the density of cellular packing. Moving on from DWI to DTI, so DWI measures random motion of motor molecules, whereas DTI allows us to measure both the velocity and the preferred direction of the diffusion in that voxel. And this is done by something called as diffusion tensor model, now from which the name diffusion tensor imaging comes from. This model allows a rotationally invariant description of the shape of the water. So what is a diffusion tensor model? Diffusion tensor model is a mathematical model, as shown here, which is a matrix of three by three vectors of the representation of the diffusion anisotropy of the brain. Now this information can be viewed geometrically as a 3D ellipsoid, which then provides us with the magnitude and the direction of the principal axes of the ellipsoids, which are called the eigenvectors or the eigenvalues, which is seen with these yellow arrows. Now this arrow is also called the primary eigenvector, which describes the direction of the maximum diffusion in that voxel. And this forms the basis of fiber tracking in DTI. And from these three eigenvalues, we calculate the diffusivity in that voxel. Now to estimate, going back, to estimate the diffusion tensor model, we need to acquire at least six different DWI sets along non-collinear direction to estimate this tensor model. However, in clinical practice, we acquire more than uh, six models, up to 30, 32 directions, to, uh, to better estimate the tensor model. So what are the metrics which we can derive from DTI? Number one is the displacement, which means how far does the molecule move during a prescribed amount of time. And this is characterized by mean diffusivity. So this is an example of CSF. There's no direction. has high mean diffusivity as opposed to gray matter, which has low mean diffusivity. The second metrics which we can derive from DTI data is direction, which means how far the, I'm sorry, the last one was uh, displacement, the second one is direction. How far does the molecule move during a prescribed amount of time along a particular direction? And this in DTI is characterized by fractional anisotropy. So this is an example of white matter, and this is an example of gray matter. They have same mean diffusivity, but the fractional anisotropy differs. Now, fractional anisotropy is the most common measure of anisotropy in DTI and also considered as a marker of integrity of a healthy white matter. Now, the FA values can range from 0 to 1, where 0 means that there is isotropic diffusion, which means there is no preferred direction, and a value of 1 means there is complete anisotropic diffusion. This is how an FA map looks like. Areas which have high FA appear bright, for example, corpus callosum and white matter. This is a color FA map which requires an additional post-processing step where a color coding scheme is applied to encode the direction of primary eigenvector, which is the direction of the maximum diffusion. And the most common color coding scheme applied is the color red to right and left fibers, the color green to anterior and posterior fibers, and the color blue to inferior superior fibers. Last but not the least is connectivity, which is also called as tractography or fiber tracking, which refers to any method which is used to estimate the trajectory of fiber tracks in the human white matter. There are two different methods by which we can do this, deterministic or probabilistic. Depending on what method you use, there are three essential steps for fiber tracking. The number one is called the seeding step, where you draw an ROI, and then you draw a seed point from where the fiber tracks will be eventually drawn. 
The second step is the propagation step, where multiple fiber tracks are propagated based on the direction of the primary eigenvector, the tensor shape, and the tensor orient orientation as seen in this example. The last step in fiber tracking is the termination step, where we terminate the fiber tracks and we use set criteria. For example, if the FA value becomes too low, for example, less than 0 0.3, the fiber tracks are terminated, or if there's sharp angulation or change in the angle of the fiber tracks, for example, more than 40 degrees, and we can set these criteria, the fiber tracks will be terminated, leading to the estimate trajectory of the fiber tracks. Moving on to clinical applications of DTI, DTI right now is a potential tool to assess the anatomy, the architecture, and integrity of white matter. These are some of the potential clinical applications. I'm just going to concentrate on the first three. Let's start with anatomy. There was a great lecture this morning with Dr. Schaff uh, in the Human Anatomy Primer. We talked about the DTI anatomy of the brain. A number of authors have applied DTI data to reconstruct various 2D and 3D atlases of white matter tract which can be used in, as an excellent educational tool to, tr uh, to train physicians and radiologists alike. Now, DTI-based segmentation of brain is an excellent phenomena. This is based on the principle that neurons that wire together fire together. And we have connected different parts of the brain based on their DTI features. And this has led to some new interesting insights to human CNS anatomy. For example, IQ has been positively correlated with increasing anisotropy in the motor association areas. Similarly, age-related FA in certain parts of brain has been strongly correlated with working memory in growing children, and there are multiple examples of these. Track-based spatial statistics is an FSL approach where you can do group comparisons of DTI data. You can take an FA value or an MD value from a particular individual and normalize that value to an external space. You can compare DTI data from one group normal to a disease group. Moving on, where DTI is playing a significant role is pre-surgical evaluation, and this applies both to tumor surgery and epilepsy surgery. When we talk about diffusion imaging in itself, whether it's DWR, DTI, it's playing an important role in every aspect of tumor imaging, whether it's diagnosis, grading, extent, surgical mapping, or post-surgical outcomes. Now, preoperative localization of fiber tracts in the white matter has been demonstrated to improve the pre-surgical planning, counseling, and outcome of patients. Now, based on this, there was an article that came in AJNR 2007 by Jenison et al., where they divided the white matter tracts into four different categories based on their DTI features. Now, most of this oversimplification process is still under validation. However, this can be very useful. For example, no special care needs to be taken during surgery if the fibers are already destroyed, as seen in this illustration. What is more commonly being used is called multimodal imaging or multimodality imaging, where we club the DTI data with other functional parameters like MR perfusion, MR spectroscopy, or functional MRI. This leads to a better informed consent by the surgeon. Now, this is an example. This patient had GBM, got resected, came back for a follow-up study. There's an enhancing nodule at the resection site. Another follow-up, there's increased T2 signal. The nodule is increasing. Is this tumor recurrence? So we did our multimodality imaging. We started with our uh, CBV or MR perfusion, which shows that there's no increased blood flow to the area of abnormality. This is functional MRI with finger tapping, which shows that the motor cortex is situated right where the enhancing lesion is. Then we had an FA map from which we constructed the corticospinal tracts, which shows that the tracts run through the lesion or at least very close to the lesion. So based on low CBV, close approximation to the motor cortex, and close association to the corticospinal tracts. And given that the MGMT methylization uh, status of this glioma was positive, a decision was made not to operate, and then this, in fact, turned out to be pseudoprogression. Moving on to congenital anomalies, uh, DTI is and will continue to improve our understanding of the complex white matter abnormalities seen in various congenital disorders. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to show you two distinct entities where DTI uh, has been very helpful to qualitatively assess the white matter tract abnormality in brainstem, number one being Joubert syndrome or Joubert syndrome-related disorder. Uh, on imaging, this is a blown-up image, axial tooth image. It presents with a molar tooth sign. We all know molar tooth sign means Joubert syndrome. But the abnormality that leads to molar tooth sign can be easily seen on DTI. So this is a normal magnified color FA map at the level of the midbrain. These are the superior cerebral peduncles. As they ascend up, they decussate at the level of midbrain. This is called the red dot sign. What happens in Joubert, this decussation is absent, which leads to this deep interpeduncular 
uh, cistern and thickening of the superior cerebellar peduncles leading to the molar tooth sign. Another example is the pontine tegmental cap dysplasia, which on imaging presents with a very small ventral, pon uh, small ventral pons, and there's a dorsal protuberance, which is called the tegmental cap. So if you look at the color FA map at the level of the pons, this is a normal individual. These are middle cerebellar peduncles, and these red fibers are the anterior, and these are the transverse spontane fibers that run through the substance of the pons. Now, in Joubert syndrome, what happens is that these transverse spontane fibers, instead of running anterior and through the substance of the pons, they run dorsal to the pons, causing this classic tegmental cap. So it's, so it's very easy from DTI to assess what's going on, uh, which we cannot see morphologically. Now, DTI does suffer from many technical constraints, which are mainly related to hardware, uh, the pulse sequence used, the imaging strategy used, even software programs to reconstruct the fiber tracks. Uh, <clears throat> two important artifacts seen in DTI are eddy current distortion and head motion. The biggest problem right now we face in DTI is because of unrealistic assumption in a voxel having homogeneous population of white matter tracks. Most often, we have these crossing fibers, diverging fibers, or kissing fibers, where DTI cannot estimate the fiber tracks, which leads to wrong estimation of fiber tracks, or sometimes leads to abrupt termination of fiber tracks, which I think is the biggest pitfall of DTI. As I said earlier, a low FA value means that there's damaged white matter, which, in, which means that a high FA means the white matter is healthy. That's far from true. For example, tumor can cause geometric distortion of fiber tracts and can lead to low FA without actual destruction or disease of the white matter tracts. Similarly, depending on the area of the brain studied, the underlying condition, whether it's edema or radiation changes, one can have low FA, which may not uh, describe an unhealthy white matter. So to conclude, I think DTI is a potential tool to assess microstructural white matter changes and brain connectivity. I think it's too, still too early to speak about the real impact DTI is playing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as I said, there are some drawbacks, but sufficient strides are being made. For example, new techniques are coming called cue ball imaging, hard imaging, and DSI, DSI imaging, which, which are going to change the face of DTI. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Megan Stutter from Vanderbilt University, who's going to talk about MR perfusion. Hello. Thank you for letting, thank you for staying, actually. I should just start with that. Um, and hopefully, it's a really nice day outside, so hopefully we'll get out and still see the sun. One thing I have realized is the sun lasts later after 5 o'clock in Toronto than I'm used to, so that's really been a bonus after these long days. So I get to talk to you about perfusion, and I'm going to back off a little bit from the physics of perfusion and try to just show you some examples of how we're using perfusion and hope that those of you who aren't using perfusion will think about this as sort of an inspiration to start using it, because I really think there are some excellent applications, and I don't have any financial disclosures. So I'm going to start by reading this slide, which I think is very um, illustrative. This was from 1996 AJNR article on MR spectroscopy, and it says, MR spectroscopy has received little attention from the clinical radiology community. Indeed, most MR spectroscopic studies are performed by a small and dedicated group of individuals, mostly basic scientists. This behavior is partly because MR spectroscopy does not produce pictures, but results in graphs. And I think given the 10-year retrospective scope, which makes us all much smarter, we can agree that the real problem was not the pictures, but the fact that there were no clear diagnoses from MR spectroscopy, or at least they were very few and far between, unless you happen to have a large population of Canavan's disease which is one of the rare things that has a specific MR spectra. So I think we're all carrying around a little PTSD from trying to, um, re to answer our clinical colleagues' questions and read into spectroscopy more than it probably had to offer. At least I feel that way. But I don't think the same can be said for MR perfusion. I think there's lots to be gained and not much to be lost by using MR perfusion. So I would really recommend that you try it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two specific applications for MR perfusion. I'm going to talk about bold imaging, and I'm going to talk about ASL. Most of you have probably used bold imaging in your um, hospitals, 
This is the one that we do for task orientation for language, where you give the patient a task um, to look at and you measure the blood flow response, and that signal gives you the bold activation. We use the changes between oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin to generate our bold images. And you probably, again, are aware of this. Oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic, whereas deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic. So if you're looking at it with T2 star, deoxyhemoglobin gives you that dephasing, that signal dropout. We're used to seeing that. This is a nice 7 Tesla where you can really see on T2 star that just the deoxyhemoglobin in the veins is enough to dephase the signal. And that's what we're seeing, and that's what we're going to exploit with the bold imaging. Okay, so here we have a artery and a tissue bed, and we can see all the oxyhemoglobin flowing nicely in. Our normal blood oxygenation is around 60%. The interesting thing is when we give the patient a task or when we give them a vasodilatory stimulus, we're using carbogen, which has carbon dioxide in it, then you actually overshoot. So you send more uh, arteries in, you send more oxygenated red blood cells in than you in need. And so that actually increases the blood oxygenation by 10 to 20%, and that's what we're measuring with bold. So again, at baseline, because of the deoxyhemoglobin, you have lower signal on the T2 star, which should brighten with activation, either task or vascular. And that's that increased signal that you see here. So this is the signal that we're acquiring during the task or the vasodilatation. So the first answer to one of the SAM questions asks, which of the following underlies the bold effect and it is this increase in the oxyhemoglobin relative to the deoxyhemoglobin, which manifests as an increase in T2 star. And I think that we can think through that, and you probably already knew that. Okay, so let's look at it in the setting of a patient. This is a patient who has moya moya disease, and this is so typical for moya moya disease patients. They have terrible arteriopathy of the internal carotid arteries, where they get stenosis to the point of occlusion, and so often they have very little by way of strokes because they really collateralize well. So here she'd had a stroke. This is it. On her structural imaging, this is all you could see. She had a left caudate infarct stroke, but she was presenting with this new TIAs, which involved her left upper extremity, so hopefully we remember enough about our neurology to know that that does not correlate with this area of infarct. So here is her angiogram. She had actually already occluded her ICA. It had gone all the way into her cervical ICA and all of her perfusion. Here's her left ICA injection. The entire right hemisphere is perfu and anterior circulation is perfused off the left ICA. Here is that on a delay. And look at the difference in the delay. This is still arterial phase. This is in the blush phase, right? The capillary blush phase. So there's a lot of delayed transit to this area. And my question on angiogram is, is that area perfused well enough? How do we know? Yes, it's delayed. So conventional perfusion metrics are difficult to read, like CT perfusion with mean transit time delays are expected. But does that mean it's ischemic, right? Is it benign oligemia or is it ischemic? And so then we get the bold and the ASL imaging, and I'm going to show you that in more detail. So here we have the bold and the ASL imaging, and you can see particularly in the right side, the parietal region where she was getting those TIAs, there's really abnormal signal. I'm going to show you that. Here's normal signal. We give the carbon dioxide. This is carbogen. That signal goes up. Here is the slightly less normal signal on the right side where she does have that delay. So watch the red signal. See how it's delayed compared to the blue? So there is a delay, but she does have good perfusion to that area. She is getting up to where we want to be. But look at this green voxel. At the time that we give carbogen, that signal goes down. That's not what we expect. So what we think is happening is in that area, she has a vascular steel phenomenon whereby all the blood vessels around that area, which are still relatively normal, can vasodilate and increase her cerebral blood volume, but she cannot do anything to compensate 
for that here. And so the blood actually goes down in that level. And that's a real sign of impairment. So that's a sign for revascularization uh, in some patients. Here is the revascularization procedure you may be familiar with. They take uh, a branch of the superficial temporal artery, which is a scalp artery, and they plug it right onto the brain and hope for that, that undergoes neoangiogenesis. And here is a really nice follow-up of that patient. Our neurosurgeons have gotten to the point where they don't even do angios after the patients have had revascularization because it's more illustrative for them to look at these bold and ASL sequences and the patient doesn't have the complications related to angiogram. So here she was, all that impairment at presentation. The EDAS is here, that's the yellow error. So they plug that superficial temporal artery right onto her brain and then look at the change in that right hemisphere. Six months and then three years later, she's almost normalized, at least the anterior part. So that's a lot better outcome and even on angio, if you did an angio, you may not know how much of that is normalized because the angio really underestimates the amount of tissue level perfusion that patients get from revascularization. So this is the same patient. I'm gonna show you the time. This is all again from the bold imaging data. So they use the path of the carbon dioxide to predict when the blood arrived at certain parts of the brain. The top is going to be the preoperative, and the bottom is going to be post. And so you'll see subtle differences, but mostly you'll see how much faster the left side is perfused than the right. And then watch how delayed that right parietal is. But I think you can see this is the static images. Here's the left side coming in, so much faster than the right. So mean transit time really means very little in these patients from an ischemic perspective. Here is this side filling in better on the postoperative, faster, but still some delay in washout compared to the normal side. Less, though, than she had before, particularly anteriorly where she got revascularized. And this can be quantified looking at the time to peak. This is the extent of the time to peak change. So you can see, particularly underlying that revascularization site, she had a significant change in the time to peak. She significantly improved the time that she got to her po po uh, peak transfusion postoperatively. Just another example, we have several of these cases that we're following now. Again, another right, this patient had bilateral disease. You can see the left side was impaired as well significantly, but they went for the right side for revascularization, either because she was symptomatic or because there were contraindications to the left side, like the STA might have been too small. Um, and then you can see, look at that perfusion at 18 months. So really nice results following uh, revascularization. Okay, so the one thing to know is you really need a three Tesla. You can't get the signal to noise on a 1.5 Tesla that you need. You are generating that many perturbations in the cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume, so you need to be able to measure it with a three Tesla. Bold is a compilation effect. It's both cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood volume. Maybe some uh, cerebral, beta, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, but we think mostly CBF or CB. V. And so that makes it difficult to know exactly what you're seeing when you do bold imaging. For that reason, we also do CBF images. Whenever we acquire the bold images, we also acquire ASL. So this is an example of what ASL looks like. You put in this uh, pulse to tag the blood water as it flows into the brain, and you subtract out the untagged from the tagged image to get the cerebral blood flow and you're measuring, hopefully, the tissue level exchange. In the past, when it was first put out there, people talked about it had every different uh, acronym known to man to describe ASL, which was a bit confusing, I think, for the rest of us. But basically, the big categories were pulsed ASL, continuous ASL, and then now pretty much everybody has adopted pseudo-continuous ASL. If you're looking to put this on your MR, if you're looking to get in a new MR or use it on an MR that you have now, you probably are going to be, your default mechanism from your vendor will be pseudo-continuous. But you should ask for that because that is the preferred method at this point. You get to use a standard body coil and you have improved signal to noise from the prior uh, applications. Okay, so again, this is what we do. 
One of the great things is we're not giving contrast. It's a radio frequency pulse, so we can do it in every patient. We have IRB approval. We can do this in children. We, you can do it over and over again. There's no, you don't have to wait for that contrast to wash out. If you miss somehow the, uh, the tag, you just re-image the patient again. So that's really nice. The pro one of the problems with it is that signal decays very quickly, and it decays with the blood water the T1 of the blood water. So that means that it changes based on, again, the strength of the magnet. So at 1.5 Tesla, it's difficult to do good ASL. If you're reading an ASL manuscript and it's, about one, it's acquired on 1.5 Tesla, it's more challenging to get those images. Three Tesla, you have 1.7 seconds. And then if you happen to be able to do it on seven Tesla, you have two and a half seconds, so a lot longer. Let me show you what that means. Here's that same Moya Moya patient that we looked at earlier. Here is her left ICA injection, and remember how she is perfusing her right side. At 500 milliseconds, this is just a healthy control patient, but you are not going to get any ASL signal because it's not there yet. It's not in the brain. Here's 750 milliseconds, so starting to get more, 1,000, 1,250. 1,500, 1,750, and we're going to image around here. Because you can see that signal is going to drop off. So very quickly we can image again because there's no signal left in the brain. The problem is in this patient, this delay where she was perfusing her right side is a five-second delay. That's how long it took from that left-sided injection for this image to be acquired because she's not perfusing that directly, remember. And that means that you get what's called arterial transit artifact. When you see this signal, that signal that's still in the collateral vessels, it's not gotten to the tissue level yet. And people call that arterial transit artifact. It does probably convey information about collateral, so it's not information you want to ignore. But it also means that in these patients, you're going to underestimate their cerebral blood flow because it hasn't gotten. The tag that you gave has decayed before it gets to where it wants to go. Okay, so next SAM question, which is true regarding ASL. Okay, so it's not performed with gadolinium. It's just, you just tag that flowing water. So this is the answer. Radio frequency pulse is used to tag blood water. Higher Tesla scanners cause faster tracer delay is false. That causes slower tracer delay, and it measures cerebral blood flow, not cerebral blood volume. Okay, so... One of the things that we can do is look at vessel-encoded ASL where you actually tag the incoming left ICA the vert and the right, and you can see if you do that, in this patient, for example, after that EDAS, the right side, which was revascularized, starts to take over into the left ACA territory. So you really get a sense of, is there enough uh, collateral supply from the other side to help perfuse that side where there's stenosis? And finally, here's an application with an M1 stent, came in with this infarct related to that severe stenosis, had a stent, and you know how difficult it is to measure, to see within a stent, you sort of have to assume based on what the perfusion is outside the stent. So here was that instant restenosis that we can get only on angiography images. So we took this person to perfusion, and you can see decreased cerebrovascular reactivity on this left side in the whole MCA territory because of that stent. Last note is perfusion has not had a lot of winners in the last stroke trials, but it had one this year. So I wanted to draw your attention to that. The Extend IA had good outcomes, and it looked at perfusion based on CT perfusion to kind of look at penumbra. So there's lots of perfusion applications, and I hope that you'll be inspired to use one in your uh, work. So now I'm going to switch cases and go to my brain cases, hopefully. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. Switching gears completely from perfusion. So plug back in, if you turn that out, <laughs> and look at these cases. Here's a 44-year-old female. She presents with fever and altered mental status, and she has this restricted diffusion with layering in the lateral ventricles. It's secondary hydrocephalus, right? The secondary finding in neuro is always hydrocephalus. And then it's heterogeneous. 
So basically the differential really is this, this blood or is this pus? That's really where we should focus our minds. But I find, as was the case here, that often we jump off that ledge into the tumor. Because I think we really love tumors as radiologists and obviously patients and referring clinicians are all very worried about them. Here's a patient who came in. The reason for the study was interventricular tumor. Really the same findings, restricted diffusion, some hydrocephalus layering in the, and there was not hemorrhage, right? So this is not an interventricular tumor. I'm going to show you some interventricular tumors, but just remember that we don't want to start here. These are zebras. These are very rare, and they very rarely present with hemorrhage. Usually they're more localized masses, as you can see in this case. Here is a choroid plexus papilloma. This is lymphoma. Yes, it can be restricted on diffusion. Yes, it can either extend into the ventricle or be interventricular, but it is going to be rare that that presents with hemorrhage or layering. This one was a choroid plexus papilloma that does have some layering effect in the occipital horn. And then here's what we see over and over, over and over and over, is the interventricular hemorrhage. I want to point something out. Whereas our case had this restricted diffusion throughout all of the contents of the ventriculars, the, this restricted diffusion is more focal. This is really susceptibility. And in the cases that I saw of interventricular hemorrhage, it was true that the, the susceptibility is not the entire case of restricted diffusion that we have in our case. Of course, you can always recommend CT to prove to yourself, here's the subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you can see that high signal, high attenuation to know that this is just interventricular hemorrhage. Lots of subarachnoid hemorrhage in this patient as well. Another case, filling those ventricles, but notice, not all restricted, just the periphery where there's more of a susceptibility effect than there is restricted <laughs> diffusion. Okay, so we have tumors, which we're really going to save. We're going to reserve those tumor diagnoses for, you know, the later callback when they're not sure what's going on, but we're not going to start there. We're going to start with interventricular hemorrhage and ventriculitis. We're going to look for secondary signs of ventriculitis, like this case with meningitis, right? You see the leptomeningeal enhancement? And ventriculitis complicates 30% of meningitis, so it's a fairly frequent problem, as well as if the patients had an extraventricular drain, we're really going to start thinking about ventriculitis. This is a sad case, just to put in your mind, the shunt had actually eroded through the skin at the clavicle on this patient, who then developed a ventriculitis, and again, you can see it's not high on attenuation, so it's not blood, it does have restricted diffusion, and there is hydrocephalus. It doesn't have gradient signal. So this is just ventriculitis. Next case is a 65-year-old. Sudden onset of left hemiparesis and neglect. So what do you see here? Hopefully you can see from even your back seat that there's bright signal in those left MCA branches. Do you see it sort of serpiginous signal throughout the left MCA territory? And I want to contrast that with this, which most of us would nail, where the, there's, the subarachnoid space is filled with bright signal. But I will say that when this is collapsed, when there's less volume loss in the brain, then that can be confusing, which one is which. So, but this is subarachnoid hemorrhage, which you can again confirm on CT. And then here is another case where you have bright signal. This time it's pus. The leptomeninges are filled with pus, and that's meningitis. And then here we have bright signal. This is three different cases. I know it's sort of subtle. I feel like I see these really profound cases, and then when I went to find cases, I thought they were all sort of subtle. But this is sedation. And this is a case of propofol sedation. I wanted to bring your attention to this article, which came out. And it, we've always sort of attributed these to hyperoxia, which I think does contribute, but also there are blood volume changes. So propofol actually decreases the cerebral blood flow, and therefore there may be increased cerebral blood volume to compensate for that. And you can see here the cerebral blood volume and the sulcal signal intensity correlated, and that correlated more strongly than hypoxia. So think that we may be inducing perfusion changes in these sedated patients that explain some of these findings. Chlorohydrate, which was not linked in one study to the, uh, these hyperintensities, increases the cerebral blood flow, so opposite 
mechanism than propofol, just to keep that in mind. And this is just an example, a visual example of hyperoxia, which acts as a vasoconstrictor. So here is a patient with room air. We're giving them carbon dioxide and room air. Here is this carbon dioxide and hyperoxia. So you can see really decrease in blood flow between the two. So we know that there's a vasoconstrictive effect of oxygen, which could be contributing. And that, again, is shown here. This is the room air, and this is the hyperoxia with the gray matter, really different cerebral blood flow. Okay, this is that patient that we saw earlier with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It actually has moya moya disease, and you can see that IV sign. So there really is that IV sign on the left side. Here's another patient with the IV sign on the right side. And that has been correlated with changes in blood volume. So the decrease in blood volume with that IV sign and increased blood volume. So again, some hemodynamic information that's conveyed by that IV sign. Or at least suggested by the IV sign. This is a good case. This patient presented with this watershed territory infarct. And interestingly, the look at that left MCA. Back far, there's some that high signal within the left MCA branches. You see that here? The I say occlusion was chronic. So I think what had happened is this is just an anterior watershed territory infarct. This gives us the information that this is more than just this. This is the entire left MCA and ACA at risk. And it was from this ICA, probably collaterals that we're seeing. This is another patient infarct with that vascular stasis here. So the infarct is here, and then this entire left MCA has that stasis. It's similar with meningitis, certainly, particularly, again, if you can't distinguish the, the fact that it looks like an artery or vein because you're looking at a patient who doesn't have any um, atrophy yet. Here, the moya moya with the IV sign, and then again with the sedation. So just one more time through these vascular cases, because I think this is an important information. Here was this patient who was called a capsular infarct. So that was called, a, a, that's an infarct that's specific to the uh, lenticular striae vessels. And it was thought that it was isolated to those, so sort of like a lacoon, but a little bigger than a lacoon because of the territory perfuses, but not enough to bring out the big guns. And this patient didn't get a CTA or presentation, so they gave the patient IV TPA, but did not go to CTA and did not go to intraarterial TPA. Now look at the flare signal. What does this tell you? It gives you a good idea that the entire left MCA territory is at risk. There's some compromise here because of that slow flow in the MCA or the collaterals. This is more than just a single occlusive ac uh, accident here with a small lacunar infarct. <coughs> the other thing to, to note is I've seen this called subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then patients won't get TPA. So that's really bad. So we really need to be careful not to call this subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in this case, here was the thrombus. It had taken out the lateral lenticular striates, but it would also put at risk the entire left MCA territory. And this patient would have been, if we had understood everything that was going on within the treatment window, a candidate for IA treatment. Okay, switching gears completely, 78-year-old with memory loss. So here we have flare imaging. And you can see some kind of generalized atrophy, some enlarged temporal horns. And just to go over the anatomy, here is the temporal horn, here's the choroidal fissure, and then here are the hippocampi. And then here is the segmentation algorithm that I find really helpful on these patients. And it showed that the hippocampal volume is here, so less than 5% compared to age-related controls. And then the inferior lateral ventricle, which is what we think of as the temporal horns, was really large in this patient. That's this. And the other interesting part of the story was that he had, atrophy had progressed rapidly. Here he was eight years before, and he had really progressed in a rapid state. 
So certainly within the differential is Alzheimer's disease. That gives you the focal medial temporal atrophy and the rate of change over time as an accelerated atrophic state is another helpful imaging finding. This is a patient who had Alzheimer's disease. They um, didn't meet the cognitive test um, threshold for Alzheimer's disease, and I thought this comment was sort of nice, so I thought we should all keep this in mind if we ever get demented. He was a nuclear engineer, and he was uh, now 77, and he didn't fail the cognitive testing because the they said it's likely that his considerable cognitive reserve has helped to preserve some of his functioning. So I think that's what we should all hope for if this happens. But he does have hippocampal atrophy and then again those large temporal horns. Here's a different scenario. This patient presented with global atrophy does have enlarged temporal horns but also some T2 changes and this is specific to HIV encephalopathy. So yes, there were enlarged temporal horns, but a much bigger picture. And you can really appreciate the amount of atrophy when you think of it as a 39-year-old. So really, when I say whole brain atrophy in a young patient, I think about HIV encephalopathy or post-radiation. Those are really the most severe. Okay, this is actually another physician. And um, here they presented with these enlarged temporal horns and this really large lateral ventricle. They were shunted, and this is following that shunt. You can see the shunt here. This person had really severe cognitive impairment. This was actually normal pressure hydrocephalus. So this sort of distended appearance with this t tinting of the corpus callosum is a hint. And this is the cause that we really, I think, are, are most uh, incumbent on us to look for when we're looking to screen for patients who are suspected for having Alzheimer's dementia is vascular dementia. You can see all of this confluent white matter change. And there is an overlap, of course, between the two. But in this patient, the hippocampal volume was normal. So even though there was significant all over atrophy, the hippocampal volume was normal. Okay, so Certainly there's a broad differential, and I really think these segmentation algorithms are very helpful in specifying that the hippocampi are involved. Before we had the segmentation algorithm, I just n almost never thought I could really definitively call anything for hippocampal atrophy, but I feel much better about it now. And this is an example of how all over the place we are. This is another physician who presented with such severe depression that he had already been treated with ECT, and he had the read was ventricular megaly is out of proportion. Consider, of course, normal pressure hydrocephalus. But when you looked at his segmentation algorithm and when his clinical picture fit, it was Alzheimer's disease. This is a nice look at, at the rate of change for mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's, and they looked specifically at the hippocampal atrophy and, dis and learned that they could be much more specific about what the risk of transversion from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease was if they considered the rate of change. So this is just one year difference, and they were able to make the transition from here where you just kind of have this generalized risk, which overall was 17% per year, to this, where it's much more specific, stratified by the rate of hippocampal atrophy. Okay, last case. This is a 57-year-old with hypertension, and here is a coronal vessel wall image through the patient's basal artery, which you can see by angio has this severe stenosis in it. And on the vessel wall, there's this hyperintense signal. So that's the actual lumen of the vasal artery here. And contrast that with the ICAs where there's normal flowing blood here. So the way that the vessel wall imaging works is you use a long turbo spin echo readout, which nulls the flowing blood because it doesn't efficiently focus the refocusing, uh, the, the moving blood. However, if there's a stenosis, then that means that you can get bright signal. So bright signal within the vessel, on the vessel wall imaging, has some flow information, we think. In this patient and in several patients that we've seen, we've found that to be true. We can improve our blood nulling, but that increases the scan time. So the scan time for this patient at three Tesla was seven minutes, which is quite a while to ask for our 
clinical patients. We can also improve the signal to noise resolution with ultra high Tesla imaging. So this is a seven Tesla scan, beautiful. So here we have the comparison angiogram, not really any plaques, but there's a plaque in the left A1, there's a plaque in the basilar. They weren't flow limiting, so you can't really get a sense of those on angiogram, but certainly you can in the vessel wall imaging. The challenge is to do that at 3T and without contrast. So this is a 3T image without contrast in a healthy patient. So without atrophy, you're sort of up a wall because you don't have much of a vessel wall contrast with the surrounding brain. You can see, though, in this patient, here's the normal A1. This person had a hypoplastic right A1. These are the ICAs coming, the M1s. The basilar is the king for vessel wall imaging because it's outlined by CSF. Here's a moya moya patient. You can see the right ICA is occluded. You can see, look at this wall thickening. Look how thin that, look how thick that uh, wall is and how thin the ICA gets in the vessel wall. Here the left M1 is occluded and here you can also see that high signal within that left M1. So it's all about signal to noise with these um, vessel wall images. You want to get the CSF to be nulled, so you use an inversion recovery similar to the flare sequence, but you can see that the vessel wall is very similar to the CSF and signal, and so the more you null the CSF, the blacker you get those images, the less you're going to be able to see the vessel wall. So it's a trade-off in that, and then you're trying to get the blood to be dark. You can improve your spatial resolution, but overall you're going to lose on signal to noise, and you're going to have longer scan times. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I get to introduce Frank uh, Minja, who is here from Yale and is going to do spine cases. Thank you. So switch the time. Yeah, that time will be on. Okay, sounds good. Great, thank you. So we're going to switch some gears from all that advanced uh, neuroradiology. We're going to talk about some uh, four spine cases. Hopefully they're going to be fun and informative. All right. No uh, relevant financial uh, disclosures. So here's our first case. It's a five-month-old male uh, with a cystic spinal lesion on ultrasound. This is what the ultrasound looked like. And just to start us with a question, what would be the correct diagnosis? A, epidermoid cyst, B, phyllocyst, cyst, C, persistent terminal ventricle, and D, a mixopapillary ependymoma. So just to go over the MR images in a little bit more detail, so we again see this large cystic lesion, which is just below the cornus medullaris. On enhanced images, there is no enhancement either of the wall of the cyst, and there's no uh, uh, solid nodule with it. And we also have diffusion-weighted images, which show no restricted diffusion within that cystic structure. All right, so the correct diagnosis is a phyla cyst, but let's first look at the distractors. So the first difference is an epidermoid cyst. So here's an example of an epidermoid cyst, which again shows a cystic lesion at the tip of the cornus medullaris. Which is, it is pretty much iso-intense to CSF on both T1 and T2-weighted images. On the axial images, we can see the cornus medullaris is uh, displaced to the left, and here's the cystic structure. And then when we do diffusion-weighted images, which confirm restricted diffusion with cystic structure, that goes with the epidermoid cyst. Again, isointense signal in T1 and T2-weighted images. It contains disquamated epithelial cells, which uh, results in the proteinaceous material, resulting in the pro positive restricted diffusion and DWI images. The other differential is a persistent terminal ventricle. So here's a cystic structure. That cystic structure is actually within the cornus medullaris. It actually appears to be contiguous with the central canal of the distal uh, spinal, uh, spinal cord. On the axial images, clearly the cystic structure is within the cornus medullaris. So this is also known in many names. Uh, other names are ventriculus terminalis, or sometimes it's called the fifth ventricle. It's a small ependymal line cavity within, which is located within the cornus medullaris, and it basically represents incomplete regression of the embryonic terminal ventricle. So it's part of like normal embryo embryology, but as for some reason it does not completely regress. So for a mixopapular ependymoma, uh, obviously this is a tumor. On enhanced images, a solid enhancement. On the T2-weighted images, we have some errors of dark T2, which correspond to hemorrhage in the uh, mixopapular ependymoma. This is the most common uh, tumor of the conus medullaris and the phylum terminale, and can often have hemorrhagic components with it. 
So back to our diagnosis, which is a file assist. Again, on sagittal titrated images, we see this uh, well-circumscribed cystic structure, which is below the conus medullaris, as opposed to what we saw in the persistent uh, terminal ventricle. So it's a simple cyst. It's commonly identified in lumbar sonography of infants, usually during the first week of life. And this is, again, just going with that ultrasound. It's a longitudinal ultrasound uh, done with a linear transducer. Here is the cornus medullaris, which is terminating around the L23 level. And just below that, you see the sort of cystic expansion, thin walled. And this causes a lot of uh, trepidation uh, uh, initially for people who haven't seen many of these, because then you start to think whether or not the patient has a cystic uh, tumor, of which uh, a mixopapular pendymoma is the one that we're most worried about. But the key is that the phyla cyst is typically located inferior to the conus medullaris, whereas the persistent terminal ventricle is located centrally within the conus medullaris, as I'm showing these two images side by side. Just incidentally on reading on these, the persistent terminal ventricle in the young patients is a totally incidental finding. However, rarely can actually also be seen in adult patients. And in some patients, I've actually linked it to like cardiac equina syndrome. And uh, so in that case, in adults, is uh, cystic lesions of the terminal ventricle it has its own classification. It's very rare, but in adult patients, uh, uh, you can suspect that sometimes they can, have a sympt they can be symptomatic. But in infants, both of these cystic structures are completely somewhat incidental. So again, when it's found as an incident, uh, incidental finding in an otherwise asymptomatic uh, uh, pediatric patient, it can be considered a normal variant. Interesting, in our case, uh, this MRI was done at around 11 months as follow-up because it was a large file of cyst. And then when we followed it again around 24 months, the cyst had completely disappeared, which is also interesting because when you start reading on it, this is one of the few entities actually which does not have a rad path correlation because whenever they're done autopsy, if they're never able to prove that this cyst actually exists, even though we can clearly see it on MRI and ultrasound. So here's our second case. It's a 60-year-old female with severe back pain. What would be the correct diagnosis? Is it arachnoiditis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, infectious meningitis, or leptomeningeal carcinomatosis? So let's just review the images in some more detail. We have a SAGE T1 image, SAGE T2, and the SAGE T1 facet with gadolinium. Now, if you look Close to you note that we have diffuse uh, leptomeningia enhancement throughout the thecal sac and within the leptomeninges, which also extending all the way up to the craniocervical junction and also surrounding the medulla and the pons. And I like this case because sometimes it's a bit of a faker because if you look at it very quickly, you might think that you're looking at a T2 fat sat image, where actually what you're looking at is a T1 fat sat with GATO. And again, you can see on the T2 image, uh, you're not seeing any abnormality. Again, that abnormal leptomeningia and subarachnoid enhancement extends all the way down into the thoracolumbar uh, uh, spine and all the way down the thecal sac. So again, if you look at this image very quickly, you might think that you're looking at a SAG T2 fat sat and not diffuse leptomeningia enhancement in this patient. So the correct diagnosis in the case was a leptomeningia carcinomatosis. Again, just to go over the distractors. So the first distractor is arachnoiditis. Here is a post-op patient with a status post laminectomy at the L4 and L5 uh, uh, level, and we have thickening of the cardiac one and nerve roots. When we look at the axial T2 at the L2 level, the cardiac one and nerve roots look pretty good. When you look down at the L4 level, you can start to see that there's clear clumping of the cardiac one and nerve roots. When you look at the L2 level compared to the L4 level, again, once the cardiac one and nerve roots exit from the cardiac one, up from the conus medullaris, this should not basically clump back again. So that's a clear sign of arachnoiditis. Again, it can present either as clumped nerve roots or an empty thecal sac if the nerve roots are completely plastered uh, at the outside of the thecal sac and often seen in post-operative post -operative patients. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an interesting one. Uh, typically, it uh, follows a viral illness, either GI or respiratory, and it can present with a smooth enhancement of the cardiac quantum nerve roots. Uh, and uh, what's not, this is a separate case of also of Guillain-Barre, but this demonstrates one finding that's seen in maybe like 30, 40% of patients where you have predominant enhancement of the ventral nerve roots as opposed to the dorsal nerve roots. And again, that can be a nicer tip-off that you're looking at Guillain-Barre in the correct uh, uh, clinical scenario. Again, we have more prominent enhancement of the ventral nerve roots as opposed to the dorsal nerve roots. Again, showing here, comparing the axial T2, which is showing you clearly the ventral nerve roots. And here on the enhancement, you can see that we have more prominent enhancement of the ventral uh, nerve roots. Uh, 
So again, in the proper clinical scenario of ascending paralysis following a viral illness, that would tip you off to a Guillain-Barre syndrome. Another distractor, obviously, is going to be infectious meningitis. Typically, that's just presents with diffuse um, uh, leptomeningeal uh, enhancement of the conus medullaris and also of the cauda equina. This can be very extensive. This is in a different patient where the entire thecal sac looks like a whiteout. Again, if you look at it very quickly, you might mistake this for uh, uh, that you're looking at an axial T2 fat at image. So, Again, the key here is going to be the history, either fever, elevated white count, and again, you typically have diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement at both the conus medullaris and the cauda equina. Back to our case of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Now, there is nothing about this that would point you that this is carcinomatosis as opposed to infectious meningitis, except that the patient would have the appropriate history of either primary malignancy and did not, may not necessarily present with fever and white count. So again, why would MRI be important? Because of the low sensitivity of CSF cytology. If you do lumbar puncture, the first go around, your sensitivity of picking it up is going to be around like 60 to 70 percent. And if you do a second lumbar puncture, that sensitivity rises up to 80 to 90 uh, percent. The most common uh, primary sites are breast, lung, and melanoma. Our case was one of melanoma. And again, I like this case because basically it was a fake out between uh, T2 fats. It's just showing tips for recognizing a post-contrast uh, facet image. I like the basal vertebral plexus, but you can see here that sometimes even the basal vertebral plexus can be somewhat bright on a T2 facet image. So for our case, actually what was helpful is actually looking again at the uh, nasal mucosa in, case, in this case the uvula to point out that you're looking at a post-contrast image. Case number seven is a 36-year-old male with a mid-thoracic uh, back pain and fever. This allows us to talk a little bit about some physics uh, technique. So in this case, we have an artifact that's present in the image. Is it aliasing? Is it blooming? Is it chemical shift? Or is it phase-encoded motion artifact? Again, looking at these images, we can see these ghost images, which correspond similar in diameter to the, to the uh, thoracic aorta, and they're going in the anterior-posterior dimension, and this is an axial T2 image, which we do not have that artifact. Again, the same artifact is seen on both pre-contrast and post-contrast images, and in this case, we're fortunate that the artifact does not obscure the thoracic spinal cord, which is often the case, and it can be very problematic on our spinal uh, imaging. So what's the MRI artifact present on an image? It's phase encoded motion. Let's just go over our differentials. So the first one is aliasing. The other term for this is known as a wraparound artifact, where you have signal from outside the prescribed field of view which maps into the image that we're looking at. Here's one uh, very bad example, obviously. We can see that the corpus callosum is mapping onto the patient's shoulder. Clearly, we have the top of the head mapping down to below the uh, cervical spine. So in this case, basically what we had is like signal from outside the field of view is mapping into, into the image. So what are the choices for removing this artifact? We can either expand the field of view, we can put a saturation band and, and block the signal from outside the field of view, or we can apply what is called a no-phase wrap, which essentially does the same. It expands the field of view and then actually blocks out that data that is acquired and only displays the field of view that we want to see. The other artifact is blooming, known also as susceptibility artifact. It results from paramagnetic material, which distorts the local magnetic uh, field, resulting in signal loss. This is an example of a uh, cavernous venous malformation with a typical popcorn appearance, bright central T2 with a hemisphereal rim. When you do gradient echo imaging, you appear to see a much larger lesion than the underlying lesion. This is sort of called the blooming effect. We can see the susceptibility effect on many sequences. You can actually see it on the B0 image of a diffusion-weighted image. Uh, so it's a poor man's gradient echo. You can see on the gradient echo image that we saw. And you can also see it on susceptibility-weighted images, which are actually uh, taken advantage of this particular artifact. And it's highly, highly sensitive for any paramagnetic material, including this little dot over here in the right occipital lobe. And it can also even pick up the deoxyhemoglobin within the veins. So the blooming just refers that the area of signal loss is a field effect and ends up being much larger than the actual lesion. The other distractor was chemical shift. Uh, this will take me a few seconds to explain. So basically protons in water and fat have different resonant frequencies. And because of this particular property, the, it results in spatial misregistration at the boundary between macroscopic fat and water. And this happens in the frequency and code direction. So here's an example of a, a corpus... Uh, uh, colossal lipoma. Uh, 
and you can see at the boundary between the lipoma and the corpus callosum, you have this dark band, which is basically that artifact. This is also in T2, where you see that band is sort of accentuating. So basically what's happening is you're having spatial misregistration uh, because of the different resonant frequencies of this macroscopic fat versus the uh, soft tissue signal from the corpus callosum. This can actually be taken advantage of in what is called chemical shift imaging. It's taken advantage of the same property that fat and water have different resonant frequencies. So at a certain TE value, you can actually see that the signal is going to be, the signal is going to be in phase, and therefore you do not have that black line. And in out of phase, at a certain TE value, that line actually gets even more accentuated. So that's taking uh, advantage of that particular property. So basically, it's one of the few artifacts that occurs in the frequency and code direction, and in and out of phase imaging can be used to accentuate those different resonant frequencies. But now we don't really use much of the in and out of phase, but more like just fat saturation. You can see here on fat saturated images, the corpus callosal lipoma drops signal nicely. So back to our uh, uh, case, which was phase encoded motion artifact. So this produces ghost images of the pulsating vessels across the field of view in the phase encoding direction. And this is a bit of a mouthful, but basically it's showing that the ghost images are related to both the TR and the heart, uh, and the actual the vessel motion, meaning the heart rate. And this is because basically you're acquiring the different uh, case-based data, at least along the phase, in, uh, phase encoding direction, at each TR interval. So if those are not in sync with the vessel pulsating, each time the vessel pulsates brings a new uh, uh, fresh blood into, into the slice, that basically is going to result in these ghost images. And to, in order to remove that, you can basically use prospective cardiac gating, which is basically putting in sync the time that you acquire, the repetition time uh, in synchronized with the heart rate. And that removes the phase encoding artifact. But for most spine images, what we do is we put spatial saturation pulses placed either over the vessel or above and below the imaging slice, and that will also remove the phase uh, mismapping. But you don't always want to remove this uh, phase encoding motion artifact because sometimes it's actually very helpful. This is a, a good case on post gather imaging. We can see this uh, pulsating artifact, which is also in the phase encoding motion artifact. On MRI, all you know is that you probably have an enhancing uh, lesion, which could be a meningioma, but it could also be a large uh, aneurysm of the ICA, which it was in this case. So just showing that the artifact sometimes can be a friend. The last case is a 45-year-old male uh, with neck pain and upper extremity weakness. So what is the correct diagnosis? Uh, is it metastatic disease? Is it traumatic kyphosis? Is it tubercular spondylar discitis? Is it pyogenic spondylar discitis? Just to go over the images, this is the patient's x-ray when they uh, presented first. We can see there is complete destruction of the C5 vertebral body. There's a slight kyphotic deformity, and there's also a somewhat of a lucency along the C5 uh, uh, vertebral body level. So these are the MR images. We can see this large epidural component. We can see the destructive changes at the C5 uh, level. We can see severe cord compression with abnormal T2 signal within the cervical spinal cord. We see that that epidural mass enhances and there's a central area of non-enhancement. When we're looking at the axial images, again, we have these paraspinal masses encased in the left vertebral artery. We have this area of central necrosis, bright on T2, no enhancement on the post-contrast images. This is actually the cervical spinal cord that is completely uh, effaced uh, by this uh, epidural component of this mass. And this ended up being tuberculous spondylar discitis. Now, just to go over the distractors, so here's your metastatic disease. Uh, we have basically enhancing uh, uh, nodules. We also have like an enhancing component down in the dependent portion of the thecal sac. So that's typical for metastatic disease. Here's another patient with uh, metastatic melanoma. Again, we have a lot of like solid enhancing tissue at the dependent portion of the thecal sac. We also have a leptomeningeal enhancement of the cardioquina nerve roots. Again, uh, uh, characteristic for metastatic disease. Traumatic kyphosis obviously will occur in the acute setting. This is an unfortunate patient, status post a motorcycle accident, which unfortunately in developing countries is becoming a major source of morbidity. So again, severe cord compression, uh, clear... Uh, fracture dislocation of the cord, and we also have on gradient echo images, uh, signal loss within the cervical spinal cord, which basically portends a bad prognosis because this patient presents quadriplegic, and now that they have blood products within the cervical spinal cord, they're unlikely uh, to recover.
here's a, a pyogenic spondylodiscitis down in the lumbar spine. We have an epidural and a prevertebral component, also resulting in severe uh, compression of the cauda equina. Uh, bright on uh, T2, bright on still images. On post-contrast images, it shows like rim enhancements or clear abscesses. On axial images, we can see that the abscesses are also extending to the paravertebral uh, psoas muscles, again with the epidural component. Now, looking at the pyogenic uh, case and the and the uh, TB uh, spondyl uh, discitis, it's not very easy to. Uh, uh, distinguish uh, uh, b between the two. However, in the appropriate uh, uh, epidemiologic uh, setting, uh, in this case this patient was from Tanzania, uh, where HIV AIDS is uh, endemic, then tuberculosis spondylodiscitis uh, should be considered. And uh, classically has been described as uh, presented with sublimental spread over several vertebral bodies, relative sparing the disc spaces and associated paraspinal masses. However, I'll tell you, if they show you cases, they very much uh, look the same. Uh, you would very pretty much see the central necrosis. You can see like abscess collections. You can see the paraspinal masses in both uh, uh, pyogenic spondylar discitis and tuberculosis spondylar discitis. So the patient's history and the epidemiologic uh, setting becomes a very important. Uh, this case uh, I liked it because it raised some issues around management and uh, in, in the U.S. and developing countries we're very uh, used to going for uh, surgical decompression especially when we see this degree of severe cord uh, compression. However it's been shown that medical management is actually the mainstay of tuberculosis spondylar discitis especially if they do not have moderate to severe via uh, neurological uh, deficits. So surgery is actually reserved for patients who present with moderate to severe neurological deficits. And just to leave you guys, this is an example for this uh, reference that I have in the images. This is a patient who presented, again, with a large abscess collection, destruction of the C4 vertebral body, severe cord compression. However, the patient went on eight months of anti-TB uh, therapy, and you can see the lesion uh, basically without surgery uh, the epidural mass completely uh, resolved. We have like a little bit of a, a loss of cervical lordosis, but a very good result. This, I'll point you out to this because basically in resource setting, poor settings, it shows that uh, they're basically showing that medical management can also take care of uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, spondylar discitis without necessarily the need for immediate uh, surgery. Thank you very much. I'm going to invite our next uh, speaker, uh, Kristen Abagno from Emory. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to switch gears a little bit and review some interesting, hopefully interesting, head and neck cases. Um, so I have nothing to disclose, so let's get going. Case number nine is a 61-year-old female who, with a history of aneurysm clipping in the past, who presented to the ER with headaches and right-sided whooshing that varied with her heartbeat, otherwise known as pulsatile tinnitus. Because of her history of aneurysm, a CTA was ordered to assess. Um, but upon further examination and questioning, um, the patient ultimately was found to have also a cherry red mass within her middle ear behind her eardrum. So here's our, our images from our CTA, and an astute observer might be able to see a tiny little uh, hypervascular mass in the inferior aspect of the middle ear, um, also known as the hypotympanum. Um, you can also see it um, in the axial view, and it's distinct from the carotid artery um, and on CT images, on bone reformatted uh, temporal bone uh, images, you can see the, the classic or characteristic permeative bone erosion adjacent to the mass. So the differential diagnosis for a pulsatile tinnitus and a middle ear mass is fairly limited, and we'll go over some of these entities. So first we, we would talk about a glomus tympanicum tumor, which is essentially a paraganglioma that's located within the middle ear cavity. It can present as a cherry red mass with pulsatile tinnitus and uh, usually is located over the cochlear promontory, but large lesions can, like this can extend through the floor of the middle ear cavity into the jugular foramen um, with this classic permeative bony erosion. And these are so-called jug jugulotympanicum uh, tumors. The imaging features of uh, glomus tympanicum is similar to paragangliomas elsewhere in the head and neck. They're very hypervascular tumors, so they're very hyper-enhancing. Um, when they're large, they can have the characteristic salt and pepper appearance, the pepper being the little flow voids that you see on T1 and T2 weighted images, and the salt being that intrinsic T1 hyperintensity that you can see throughout the lesion. And then again, characteristically, you would see this permeative bone erosion on CT of the skull base around the lesion. <clears throat> 
um, a differential for a retrotympanic vascular mass would include a lateralized internal carotid artery, which is a pretty rare variant, um, a course of the internal carotid artery, which would extend into the skull base lateral to the cochlear promontory, crossing through the anterior mesotympanum, and it can have overlying thin and dehiscent bone and can certainly present with pulsatile tendinous and a retrotympanic mass. An even rarer variant, um, very similar in appearance, um, is the aberrant ICA, and the only difference there is that uh, the ICA courses from a large inferior tympanic canaliculus to join the ICA, and at that connection point, there's a little area of stenosis um, uh, of the ICA. But again, this lesion can present as a retrotympanic vascular mass. If you're trying to determine if your patient has an aberrant or lateralized internal carotid artery, the easiest way, um, which is of course very important to note on any preoperative temporal bone imaging, um, the easiest way we found is to go to the level of the basal turn of the cochlea on the axillary image, draw a line perpendicular to that basal turn of the cochlea. If your carotid is medial to that line, then it's normal in course. If it's lateral to that line, it's either aberrant or a lateralized ICA. Another differential for a middle ear mass with pulsatile tinnitus, um, and interestingly, is a cholesteatoma. They can occasionally present with a pulsatile tinnitus. Certainly can cause a middle ear mass and bony erosion. Um, we're all familiar with these. There's either congenital or acquired. Acquired cholesteatomas typically are going to be seen, uh, or at least start, in the epitympanum and Prusak space. And you're going to see other uh, imaging features associated with chronic otitis media, sclerosis or under of the mastoid and maybe some fluid. Um, congenital lesions are essentially just a, um, an epidermoid within the middle ear space and usually located in the mesotympanum. But again, on uh, otoscopy, a clinician's going to see characteristically a pearly white mass in the mesotympanum um, or in the epitympanum. Uh, if it's an acquired cholesteatoma, they may also be associated with a tympanic memory retraction pocket or a perforation as well. Cholesteatoma is typically on exam. Again, you're going to see a bony um, uh, bony erosion of the ossicles or the adjacent tegmen with this non-dependent soft tissue mass. This is a, a, an acquired cholesteatoma in the epitympanum, and you can see the characteristic loss or uh, blunting of the sputum compared to the normal side in this patient. A high writing or dehiscent jugular bulb can also present as a retrotympanic vascular mass and cause pulsatile tinnitus. It's one of the more common causes of pulsatile tinnitus. Um, if you're trying to decide if your jugular bulb was dehiscent, you uh, usually look at the basal turn of the cochlea, and if your jugular bulb is still present, um, it may be high writing. Certainly, if you get to the level of the internal auditory canal, it would definitely be considered high writing. Um, and again, it's, if it's dehiscent, um, or certainly if there's a little diverticulum prolapsing into the middle ear cavity, it can certainly cause pulsatile tinnitus and be the source of a retrotympanic uh, vascular mass. Again, if, uh, if your jugular bulb is present at the level of the basal turn of the cochlea, we can consider it high riding. And interestingly, this, this patient also has a lateralized internal carotid artery, which are two uh, anatomic variants you definitely want to note on any pre-surgical temporal bone study. So, of course, in our patient, the diagnosis was a glomus tympanicum tumor, again, a hypervascular mass in the hypotympanum with this characteristic permeated bony erosion. And remember, these are paragangliomas that um, usually start if it's just a tympanicum portion. It's usually in the region of the uh, cochlear promontory in the hypotympanum, um, but they can extend down to the jugular foramen um, and then therefore be called jugular tympanicum tumors. Again, it's otoscopically evident as a reddish retrotympanic mass. And if you have a tiny lesion like this, it's really best seen on your thin section temporal bone CT reformats. I just wanted to touch uh, talk just a minute about pulsatile tinnitus in general. It's a fairly uh, infrequent occurrence. It's less than 10% of tinnitus patients, but it can have a very high yield on imaging, and so imaging is part of the workup of these patients. Um, there's subjective and objective tinnitus, um, and um, objective tinnitus can have up to 100% yield on diagnostic imaging, objective tinnitus being the tinnitus when a clinician can put a, a stethoscope around the ear and actually hear a brewery. Um, most of these are going to be vascular in etiology, and so um, you'll see venous um, is the most common cause, but there are also many, a host of arterial causes of pulsatile tinnitus, including carotid atherosclerosis or dissections. Um, there are otologic causes that we discussed, uh, cholesteatoma, and of course neoplastic and underlying systemic causes.
the best study for the initial diagnosis for pulsatile tinnitus that would essentially um, um, elucidate all of those causes, with the exception of dural AV fistula, would be a hybrid CTA CT venogram with thin section temporal bone reformats. Um, you want to go all the way down to your carotid bifurcation and all the way to the vertex, and essentially you can exclude uh, any of those um, lesions um, on that differential. So it really should be the first line test. So in summary, most cases of pulsatile tinnitus are vascular in etiology, and the initial study with the highest yield would be the CTA-CTV uh, study. All right, so moving on. Case 10, an 18-year-old with headache. And we have a CT image that demonstrates a very well-circumscribed expansile and lytic lesion in the region of the petrous portion of the temporal bone, which is very characteristically very, very bright on T1-weighted images and T2-weighted images. So this is essentially a petrous apex mass, and remember the petrous apex is just a petrous portion of the temporal bone, um, which is an area that can be variably pneumatized and can be the host of several different pathologies um, that we'll elucidate here. But in any, all of the workup of a petrous apex mass, we find it really helpful um, to do both CT and MRI. They can often be very complementary to help you um, come up with a diagnosis. So there's a host of differential diagnosis of lesions that can occur in the petrous apex, and we're just going to go through those. So asymmetric marrow in the petrous apex is really a pseudo lesion, um, and that we see some of the residents can um, kind of uh, get mixed up or tripped up on when they're looking particularly at T1-weighted images alone. And you can see there's um, a bright apparent lesion in the petrous apex on this right side, but you'll note it's really non-expansile. It doesn't, doesn't look expansile like in our last case. Um, if you look at all the other images, you'll see it's iso-intense to the rest of the marrow of the skull base on the T2-weighted images, and it loses signal, saturates out on your fat-saturated post-contrast images. Um, and so this is just normal fatty marrow. It's iso-intense to marrow on all the sequences. And if there's ever any questions, certainly you can look at your CT, where you see just normal non-pneumatized petrous apex that just jumps out at you because of the pneumatization on the contralateral side. Another finding that is, can kind of look like our first case is um, trapped fluid in the petrous apex. Remember, there are petrous apex air cells that are mucosa lined, and you can get fluid within them. That's going to be hyper intense on T2 weighted images. But if it's just simple trapped fluid, uh, which is a normal variant, you should still see retained septations within the petrous apex air cells. It can be variable in signal on T1 weighted images, which can be pretty confusing and might simulate a cholesterol granuloma uh, if there's proteinaceous secretions in the, in the T1 weighted uh, image. But on CT, you should definitely see retained septations and no significant expansion within that area um, to be able to call it just trap fluid. A cholesterol granuloma, on the other hand, is going to be definitely a characteristic, very well circumscribed lytic lesion within the um, petrous apex. It's going to have a very narrow zone of transition, very um, thin, uh, well circumscribed wall. It's um, Characteristically very, very bright on T1-weighted pre-contrast images, bright on your T2-weighted images, and can't even have a fluid-fluid level uh, due to repeat hemorrhage within the lesion. Um, there should be no appreciable enhancement uh, given the intrinsic T1 hyperintensity. Chondrosarcoma is another lesion that loves the petrous apex, particularly loves the petroclival synchondrosis, the junction of the petrous portion of the temporal bone with the clivus. Um, again, it's a lytic, very, fairly well circumscribed expansile lesion. Um, characteristically very bright on T2-weighted images, can be fairly lobulated uh, in margins, um, similar to our initial lesion. Um, but on uh, post-contrast images, you should see definitely enhancement, although it is variable in, in degree, the amount of enhancement that you might see. But the pre-contrast images are really going to help you say that there's, uh, it's low signal on T1 and then uh, definitely enhances. Um, chordoma is another lesion to think about in this location. certainly belongs on the uh, differential, but the lesion, uh, kind of epicenter of the lesion being in the region of this petroclival synchondrosis would make you lean more towards chondrosarcoma. Here's just another example of a chondrosarcoma that shows this more characteristic chondroid matrix, these arcs and rings that you can see, in about 50% of cases that will help you um, come down on it being more of a chondrosarcoma. Again, very T2, but variably enhancing. 
Um, and then finally, petrous apicitis is really going to be um, a very different clinical scenario. These patients are going to be pretty sick. It's usually a complicated acute otitis media that then extends into the petrous apex, causing kind of a skull-based osteomyelitis. You'll see expansile soft tissue in the petrous apex with some bony erosions. And then on post-contrast MRI, you're going to see enhancement of the marrow extending into the skull base, into the mastoid air cells and soft tissues, um, maybe some leptomeningeal enhancement and intracranial extension, and even vascular compromise. Um, again, these patients are going to have uh, multiple cranial neuropathies and be fairly sick. So the diagnosis in our patient of this expansile lesion that's intrinsically bright on T1 is, of course, a cholesterol granuloma, which is the most common primary lesion of the petrous apex, and as a result of chronic obstruction of previously pneumatized petrous apex air cells, there's a characteristic breakdown of red blood cells within the area, within the lesion, that then leads to the deposition of cholesterol crystals, um, which then incites a sterile inflammatory reaction and causes this lesion to grow. Initially, they're incidental and asymptomatic, but when they become large, they can present with facial nerve uh, and eighth nerve palsies. And again, they're classically very bright on T1-weighted images, and they can have the fluid fluid levels, uh, the dark hemocenter and ring, and the intrinsic T1 hyperintensity due to the breakdown of the blood products. So again, cholesterol granulomas can certainly mimic enhancing lesions, and your pre-contrast imaging is going to be really helpful. If it's bright on the T1 pre and expansile, it's a cholesterol granuloma. Um, for any petrous apex lesions, though, if you're confused, um, get another study. We always do that, right? Get uh, MRI and CT are very complementary in the diagnosis. All right, case 11, 49-year-old male with right neck mass, um, and we have a neck CT that demonstrates a kind of a cystic or necrotic lesion in the right level two region with a little bit of mural nodularity around the periphery of this lesion. So a differential diagnosis of all comers, cystic neck mass, you might think about congenital lesions, branchial cleft cyst with our glossal duct cyst. Really, that's really gonna be in a child or a very young adult. Um, but more commonly, we're gonna start thinking about squamous cell carcinoma or uh, occasionally separative lymphadenitis. So we'll go through these. So a second branchial cleft cyst, which is the one that you would think about at the level two region, kind of along the anterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and posterior to the submandibular gland, um, is, a, is should be very, very simple and cystic appearing in all your imaging modalities. Really shouldn't see any significant nodularity um, and should have um, you know, can have internal echoes or debris and increase through transmission, just comp uh, compatible with a very simple cyst. Again, it's a remnant of the second branchial apparatus, and it's the most common of all branchial cleft cysts or um, branchial cleft remnants. Um, we can see that cyst often in that level two region, and it can mimic uh, necrotic lymphadenopathy. Um, again, it can present with a painless, simple cystic mass in a child or a young adult, but in any adult patient, this should be a diagnosis of exclusion because metastatic cystic, uh, uh, metastatic uh, lymphadenopathy um, is, uh, a, it should be excluded. Um, occasionally, branchial cleft cysts can get infected. They can enlarge with upper respiratory infections and become infected. Um, so you may see inflammatory changes around that. And there's a pathognomonic sign called the notch sign, which you may be um, able to see where you see this um, fluid or cystic change extending between the internal and external carotid arteries. So this is what we really don't want to miss in our patients is squamous cell carcinoma. And remember that nodal metastasis from a head and neck primary squam can be often necrotic and, and can even appear cystic. And this is what we're used to seeing, a large mass in the base of tongue with necrotic lymphadenopathy, even a non-necrotic node on the contralateral side. Um, but the, remember that um, you can have just a very simple little cystic lesion in the level two region uh, with maybe a little peripheral enhancement um, and can present as a, a nodal metastatic disease. And it's really important if you see a cystic neck mass to carefully scrutinize the air digestive tract and look for that primary lesion, which happened to be the tonsil in this particular patient. Um, these, um, you, sometimes you can see these cystic masses and not see a primary at all, and these are considered unknown primary tumors, most common sites being the oropharynx, the tonsil, or the base of tongue, but also the nasopharynx, pure form sinus, or skin can cause metastasis. Any nodularity at all in these lesions definitely should raise concern for malignancy in an adult, in an adult and prompt a biopsy. Separative lymphadenopathy is something also to think about when you see a cystic neck mass. Um, and you can see intranodal fluid within these lymph nodes and large lymph nodes, but the key to making the diagnosis is noting the surrounding inflammatory changes, the fluid and soft tissue stranding that you can see. These most often occur in submandibular, jugulodegastric, or retropharyngeal nodes. And when you see this, you want to look for a source of infection, usually odontogenic or salivary in nature. And again, these patients are usually going to be sick. They may have some overlying erythema, tenderness, fever, and a white count. 
Um, and then finally, the most common congenital neck mass really doesn't go with a level two neck mass, but we included it. Um, and it's a, a thyroglossal duct remnant, which is a cyst that it can occur anywhere along the tract from the foramen cecum all the way down to the native or, uh, location of the um, thyroid gland, but usually in and around the hyoid bone. It's usually an anterior cystic mass that can move with swallowing or tongue protrusion. And just keep in mind that you can see thyroid malignancy very rarely in these lesions. So here's some um, examples of a non-infected kind of incidental thyroglossal duct cyst in and around intimately associated with the hyoid bone. As you come down more inferiorly in the infrahyoid neck, they can be paramedian in location. And when these become infected, as they can occur, um, they can become septated and have some peripheral stranding. Um, so again, the diagnosis in our case is that of squamous cell carcinoma, and I just wanted to bring up that uh, HPV-related squamous cell carcinoma is an epidemic currently presenting in younger patients, non-smokers, and often presents with cystic nodal metastasis. And purely cystic nodal mets can really make the diagnosis challenging because PET can often be negative and your FNA can often be negative. So if you don't find a primary lesion, often uh, these patients can require surgical incision for diagnosis. So necrotic lymphadenopathy, much, much more common than congenital lesions in the abdomen absence of any inflammatory changes, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma is a diagnosis of exclusion, and you really should biopsy. And just keep in mind that oropharynx is the most common site. Okay, our final case, a 48-year-old with vision changes. We have an MRI of the orbits that demonstrates apparent enhancement in the intraconal and extraconal fat and in the anterior chamber. But then when you look at the T1 and T2 weighted images, you don't really see any abnormal soft tissue, and there's this little punctate area of susceptibility along the anterior chamber of the globe. So our differential is uh, incomplete fat suppression artifact, lymphoma, orbital cellulitis, or orbital pseudotumor. These are all um, uh, things that can mimic or look like an infiltrative orbital mass. So incomplete fat suppression is something that might, we might see if you're only looking at your fat-saturated sequences. You look, uh, you see these band-like areas of signal abnormality throughout the intraconal and extraconal fat with relative preservation of the other remaining orbital structures and architecture. But then when you look on your T1-weighted images, you see no abnormal soft tissue. And often you can look on your coronal images and see the offending agent, which is often dental hardware or amalgam, causing that artifact. Orbital lymphoma can also present as a transpatial enhancing soft tissue mass, um, characteristically, uh, which you can confirm on the T1 images. And it looks similar to extranodal lymphoma elsewhere in the head and neck as it, it's very hypercellular, so it's hypointense on T2 and can restrict on diffusion. Orbital cellulitis is also something you might consider, as in this patient, um, with enhancement of the chorioretinal layer um, and uh, enhancement along the optic nerve and, and the intraconal and extraconal fat. And you can see there is definitely abnormal soft tissue in the T1-weighted images. And these patients often have an acute onset of pain, swelling, and fever. Um, this was a patient who had HIV and was, uh, this is a raging toxoplasmosis. So think about atypical agents that the patient's immunocompromised. And then finally, orbital pseudotumor is a big mimicker um, can present as a diffuse or transpatial infiltrative mass um, that certainly can mimic lymphoma or infection. Um, and we call orbital pseudotumor is also called nonspecific or idiopathic orbital inflammation. And remember, that's idiopathic, meaning there hasn't been an underlying systemic disease. Um, but you need to uh, elucidate um, uh, or investigate um, to see if the patient has an underlying systemic disease such as sarcoidosis um, or other collagen vascular disease, IgG4-related disease, or, um, can also present with a similar imaging appearance. So um, this patient, of course, was a patient with fat suppression artifact. Um, and I just wanted to briefly talk about um, the fat sat technique. Um, the most common uh, technique that we use for fat suppression is the spectral fat saturation technique, which takes advantage of the fact that water and fat protons resonate at slightly different frequencies in the magnetic field, and that ferromagnetic substances such as dental amalgam or a keratoprosthesis, as in our patient, um, that was used for corneal transplant, um, as well as... Um, um, air, uh, different magnetic susceptibility between the air and bone I interfaces can both lead to a change in the specific resonance frequency of fat in these areas and distort the homogeneity of the magnetic field, leading to incomplete fat suppression, uh, which can certainly mimic an infiltrative mass, so certainly look at your pre-contrast T1-weighted images. And then if you do come across a true infiltrative orbital mass, really these patients, if they're not steroid responsive, are often going to recommend biopsy um, to exclude uh, lymphoma or other neoplasm. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I just um, get to introduce Dr. Fink, Kathleen Fink, from University of Washington, who's going to talk about trauma. Hello. Thank you. You've made it. I believe I'm the last one today, so thank you all for staying around and listening.
and uh, we're going to talk about some trauma cases. I have a disclosure, but that should not affect the contents of this presentation. Okay, so let's just get right in uh, to it. This is a 26-year-old who'd recently gotten some uh, acrylic nails and was uh, brushing her hair away from her face and developed severe eye pain. So if we look at the uh, images here, we can see some findings. There is some um, periorbital edema here on the left side. And if we look at the anterior chambers, we can see that the anterior chambers are slightly different in uh, density, but the volumes of the globes are symmetric. So if we look at the differential diagnosis, I'm going to show you a series of, uh, of cases here. So this is a 61-year-old who was struck in the eye by a piece of falling wood while he was logging. And in this case, we can see that the anterior chambers are symmetric in size. Uh, the density of the chambers are symmetric. But there's a linear hyperdensity here that traverses the cornea and enters the anterior chamber to the plane of the iris. So this is a, a retained foreign body, a retained wood fragment, and a penetrating injury to the globe. On the spectrum of these uh, injuries, this is a 70-year-old who is working with nails without eye protection. I think uh, one of the teaching points here is always use eye protection. He was struck in the eye with a nail, and now we can see that the anterior chambers are not symmetric. There's either some loss here and or some very high-density material like blood in the anterior chamber. And uh, um, as we look posterior to the lens, we see high-density material in the vitreous chamber. And when we compare the sizes of the globes, we can see that this globe is slightly smaller and also there's an irregular contour. So this is a, another, a penetrating injury where the anterior chamber is deflated, there's vitreous hem hemorrhage, and this would fall under frank globe rupture. And then this is a woman who is actually attacked with a screwdriver to the, to the eye, and now the globe is very abnormal. It's clearly small hyperdense throughout. There's even gas in the globe. So now this is a penetrating injury with frank globe uh, rupture. Now on our differential is a case such as this. Um, here we see hyperdense material in the vitreous chamber, but this hyperdense material looks lentiform and we never see a lens elsewhere. So this is lens dislocation. When you have lens dislocation, it's usually posterior. And if you see bilateral lens dislocation, then you need to start thinking about a connective di uh, tissue disorder like Marfan's. Um, so our case was a case of corneal laceration and anterior chamber injury. And the, um, the uh, ophthalmologist considered this an open globe, and she was taken to surgery. Uh, where her cornea was repaired. So let's remember globe anatomy briefly. This is from Gray's Anatomy. The anterior chamber is this fluid-filled uh, space that we can see on CT anterior to the lens. The posterior chamber is a very small space that's between the iris and the lens and is bounded by the um, zonular fibers laterally. We can't really differentiate that on CT from this large posterior chamber, the vitreous chamber that contains the vitreous body. So you can use the term posterior segment to include all of this um, chamber below, behind the lens. When we look at the globes, the globes should be symmetric and of similar densities. This is a normal, as composed to this case where there's a gull wing shape uh, collection um, that is due to retinal hemorrhage. And notice that that is bounded centrally at the uh, insertion of the optic nerve. Now we can contrast that to this case where we see again hyperdensity along the margin of the uh, globe, but this is well removed from the optic nerve uh, insertion and kind of has this, this appearance of the baseball stitching shape here. And this is choroidal hemorrhage. I'm showing you a, um, just a choroidal hemorrhage along the lateral mar margin of the globe, but oftentimes you can see it along the lateral and the medial margin in the same globe. But just be aware that there are lots of globe surgeries surgeries and uh, retinal detachment treatments that can result in appearance of choroidal or vitreous hemorrhage when it's iatrogenic. And also remember that chronic conditions like Coates disease can mimic retinal hemorrhage. So if you do see a finding that's unexpected, a quick look at the medical record can help you decide whether this is a known problem, a, a post-surgical change, or an unsuspected retinal hemorrhage, which would require acute treatment. Now, after orbital trauma, it's very 
important to look for uh, intraocular foreign bodies, as in the case here. If you see them, be very precise on the localization because that can help them with uh, surgical planning, particularly whether it's within the globe or external to the globe. And as a uh, QA, QI issue, un unrecognized retained foreign bodies are um, a significant risk for intraorbital infections that can threaten vision. Furthermore, anybody who's had trauma and who is going to undergo a MRI scan, you want to pay careful attention to whether there's a retained metallic foreign body that can move during your MR scanning. Okay, so let's move on to our next case. The history here, this was a nine-year-old. She was restrained in a booster seat, but she was in a motor vehicle crash where there was actually uh, the log intrusion into the car. So it was a severe motor vehicle crash. She was intubated and sedated on arrival, and she got this uh, set of uh, images. So let's look at the findings first, focusing on the CT scan. And we can see that there's facet widening here. Okay, so at C0C1, there's asymmetric widening of the facet joint on the left. Um, although C12 is symmetric, these facet joints are markedly widened bilaterally. And on the sagittal or lateral view, we see that there's widening of the interspinous distance at C12. Uh, MRI was obtained, and uh, we can see that the uh, cerebral, excuse me, that the cervical spinal cord is markedly abnormal. It's widened and it's heterogeneous, and there's also edema in the interspinous ligament. So let's consider our differential diagnosis, which is going to include craniocervical dissociation, uh, incomplete ossification of the articular pillars. This is a child, uh, jumped facets or pseudosubluxation. So let's look first at jumped facets. So when we go to an off midline sagittal view, we can see normal facets line up like shingles. But a jumped facet occurs when the inferior articular process, instead of being posterior, is anterior to the uh, superior articular process of the uh, um, vertebral body below, OK? Uh, Jumped facets are always associated with anterolysis, okay? And then on axial view, you can see what has been termed the open hamburger bun sign, whereas normally the facets look like a closed bun. When the, um, the bun uh, sides have been flipped, that's a sign of a jumped facet. Now, every time we see a child, we always have to wonder, is there some ossification problem here, um, especially if we don't do a lot of pediatric imaging? So there is a complex ossification pattern of the um, vertebra. The C1 axis has three ossification centers, two neural arches, and one uh, anterior arch. And there is usually complete fusion by age seven, although there are certainly variations in fusion. Um, C2 is very complicated with, with five ossification centers, five primary ossification centers, including two odontoid ossification centers, a neural arch, excuse me, two neural arches, and a centrum. And the complete fusion occurs here by usually ages three to five. And this is the normal fused appearance. And notice that many of these fusion abnormalities are not going to result in facet widening. Now, pseudosubluxation is an entity that we see oftentimes on radiographs where there's uh, anterolysis, usually at C2 and C3. But notice the spinal laminar line, which is a line that connects the anterior margin of the um, posterior arch from C1 to C3 is intact. All the... Um, all the uh, lamina line up on the spinal laminar line. Pseudosubluxation usually occurs in children less than age eight. And in a, this is a separate case of a seven-year-old where we see anterolysis of C2 and C3. And there was concern because he had significant injury. But the MRI shows that there, all the ligaments are intact. There's no evidence of ligamentous injury. So you can use MRI for troubleshooting. And the correct diagnosis here is craniocervical dissociation. So that term includes both AOD, atlanto-occipital dissociation, and AAD, atlanto-axial dissociation. So sometimes, this case is not so subtle, but sometimes the uh, features of craniocervical dissociation can be subtle. So that's when you can get your ruler out and start uh, considering this. Um, some published numbers include widening of the C12 spinal laminar line greater than 8 millimeters. Here it was 12. 
the um, Bayesian dental interval greater than nine and a half millimeters. Here it was 11. Um, you can add the uh, spaces between C0, C1, and those added numbers should be less, uh, less than 4.3 millimeters. So here it was uh, 5.9 millimeters. And the morphologic thing you can look for is this V-shaped configuration between the uh, ring of C1 and the uh, odontoid. If you have uh, spine fractures at one level, particularly if they're severe, there's often injuries at other levels. So I don't know, did you notice the injury with widening of the interspinous space at C6-7? And on MRI, there's uh, edema and injury to the interspinous ligament here. So you always want to make sure you don't get distracted by this very severe injury and miss the other uh, injury. Um, so in the case of craniocervical dissociation or in any case of spinal cord trauma, MRI is useful to assess for cord contusion, cord hemorrhage, epidural hematoma, which is what I'm showing you here. There's an epidural collection. The um, dura is uh, peeled away from the adjacent uh, ligaments. And you can also assess for ligamentous injury. And um, Cord injury has already been discussed briefly, but ranges from cord contusion to hemorrhage, where you start to see signal loss within the cord. This is, again, to reiterate the earlier presentation, this is a sign of poor prognosis. And sometimes, unfortunately, there's frank discontinuity of the cord, which refers to cord transection. Okay, so our next case, this is a 63-year-old who was a victim of domestic violence. Head CT was pretty normal. MRI was performed, and MRI is very helpful here. In this case, it was obtained because the neurologic exam was very poor. Um, and what we see is that there seems to be some exaggeration of this gray-white difference uh, diffusely. Sometimes you can see some thickening of the cortical ribbon. And on DWI, you know, you start to wonder, is this cortex um, hyperintense? So if we look at some more sequences from this MRI, T1 is pretty unremarkable. T2, the cortex looks just a little thickened, doesn't it? And the DWI, if we look at the ADC, we can see that this is true restricted diffusion, that the cortical ribbon is dark. So the differential diagnosis here is going to include cerebritis. Again, we see thickened cortical ribbon, exaggeration of the gray-white differentiation on flare. There's true restricted diffusion in this case, but the patient seems to have had some sort of procedure, so there must be more to this story. And that's when it's useful to go back and look at the history. So this was the presentation CT. You can see that there's this enhancing extra axial collection. There's sinus opacification. This is the current MRI post-evacuation of this subdural empyema. And you can see that there's a, a ring-enhancing lesion with restricted diffusion, so there's a cerebral abscess. And so in this case, this was cerebritis. Now, usually if you're going to see cerebritis this extensive, it will not occur in isolation, so you can use these ancillary findings to make the diagnosis. Here's another case of someone who presented in status, and as we look carefully, we can see there's flare signal hyperintensity in the left frontal lobe involving the cortex. The other cortex is spared. Again, there's high DWI signal of the cortex, and true restricted diffusion. By that, I mean ADC values are low. Um, EEG showed left frontal seizures, so that was a nice correlation. And so again, this is a finding you can see with status epilepticus, but unlike our case, this is more localized and not diffuse. Um, and the abnormality uh, resolved when they uh, obtained a repeat MRI one month later, actually looking for the cause of her seizures. Notice that when it resolved, there's no DWI restriction at this time. Now, sometimes you might wonder, well, is this normal or is this abnormal? I'm showing you a normal brain here where there is gray-white uh, differentiation on flare. You know, the gray matter is brighter than the adjacent uh, white matter, as on DWI, but the, D the ADC map is pretty uniform gray, okay? So the correct diagnosis here is diffuse anoxic brain injury. Um, we discussed most of these points already, including that this can be very difficult to discern because it's a diffuse bilateral problem, and comparison to a normal can be helpful. So I've even done this where I see uh, this uh, increased diffuse signal hyperintensity. I'll look at a normal MRI obtained the same day to try to determine if it's too much. And also ADC is very helpful because if ADC is dark, that makes you pretty certain that it's abnormal.
The final differential that I want to show you, just as an interesting case, although the clinical history is, ex is decidedly different, is CJD. So Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease can uh, manifest as flare and DWI signal hyperintensity involving more than three cortical gyri. So here's flare showing you involvement in multiple gyri. Uh, and in this case, DWI, it was helpful in confirming this diagnosis with, again, decreased ADC values. And the diagnosis of CJD um, as uh, um, described in this AJNR article from 2005, can be made if you have involvement of three cortical gyri or the cauda amputation and one cortical gyri. But luckily, oftentimes with diffuse anoxic brain injury, the history will be helpful to guide you to that. So our next case is a 54-year-old who was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He had some hemiparesis, so a brain MRI was obtained, and uh, this uh, prompted a uh, CTA. So the brain MRI shows restricted diffusion in this deep watershed area, as well as in the ACA-MCA and ACA-PCA watershed, uh, superficial watershed areas. Um, the CTA now, if we look at the left internal carotid artery, there's a filling defect which appears linear, and the lumen here is focally enlarged compared to the contralateral normal ICA. This is ICA, this is ECA, ECA, and ICA. And the oblique sagittal reformants are actually very helpful here because we can see that there's focal uh, dilatation of the vessel with this uh, uh, intimal filling defect, or linear filling defect, I should say. If we think about our differential, we might want to think about atherosclerosis. This is a good location for atherosclerosis at the carotid bifurcation. And atherosclerosis tends to have uh, calcifications as, as a component of it. So I'm showing you some wall calcifications here. But absolutely, you can have non-calcified uh, uh, vessel plaque. And you can have luminal irregularity. And here I'm showing you a penetrating ulcer. In atherosclerosis, you tend to have an older patient, and you tend to have atherosclerotic disease elsewhere. Fibromuscular dysplasia can, is on the differential diagnosis, and this can be a, a, a difficult differential to make. Um, there are many varieties of fibromuscular dysplasia. The one we see most commonly tends to occur at C12 in younger patients, especially women. In general, there's not an intimal flap, and there's no calcification to help you differentiate it from atherosclerosis. And axials here, we see an undulating pattern to the uh, lumen, but no uh, linear filling defect. So the correct diagnosis here was blunt cerebral vascular injury, and this was a pseudoaneurysm, which is a Denver grade 3, uh, which was complicated by an infarction. So if you see an infarct after trauma, blunt cerebral vascular injury is an important predisposing cause. And there are uh, Denver and modified Denver criteria that identify which patients might benefit from screening. This is a lot of information, but there are certain clinical signs uh, that should uh, trigger uh, screening, as well as certain injuries, particularly mid-face fractures, mandible fractures, uh, temporal bone fractures, skull base fractures, and then cervical spine fractures. And some of these, we can help uh, trigger the screening. You can grade uh, blunt cerebral vascular injury according to this Denver grade. I'm showing you grade one here, which is uh, vessel raw irregularity. This is a carotid artery. This is a different patient with a vertebral artery injury uh, with less than 25% luminal stenosis. Grade two uh, includes different uh, categories. Here I'm showing you where there's a intramal, excuse me, intraluminal thrombus. Uh, and up higher, there's luminal narrowing. This is going to be greater than 25%, but not complete occlusion. And here's a different case where there's luminal narrowing. And this is the case of the jump facets I showed you earlier. And then so you can also see uh, uh, intraluminal flap would make it grade two. Grade three is a pseudoaneurysm, like the case that I showed you. And grade four is complete vessel occlusion. So this is a conventional angiogram showing you the left vertebral artery, which is occluded. And in this case, the um, artery is reconstituted distally through these uh, ascending muscular collaterals. So if you see blunt cerebral vascular injury on screening, the patient's at risk for infarct and may benefit from therapy, but you have to balance the risks of therapy with the risks of hemorrhage, particularly in trauma patients. And if you do see a blunt cerebral vascular injury, follow-up imaging may be required. Thank you very much.
I want to thank uh, all the speakers for an excellent talk and thank you all for the attention. I'm going to open the podium for some questions. I do have one question from the virtual audience. If anyone has a question, I'll go ahead and take some questions. So we have one question from virtual audience from Charles, which says that anyone can comment on the role of PET-CT in the detection of GBM recurrence, pseudoprogression versus tumor recurrence versus radiation necrosis. We are in community hospital with 3T Phillips scanner without dedicated software for MR perfusion. We could invest in these software, however, I'm not sure if they are the biggest bang for our buck. Any suggestions? Megan, what do you want to write? <laughs> You know, this is exactly the problem that we've had with using these advanced applications for recurrent GBM because it's a mixed bag that's in there and whatever you use to look at it I think is going to come up short and, you know, you think it's because you don't have the right tools, but I just think the answer is it's going to be a mixed bag. That said, we use perfusion on, on, uh, our, for our GBM recurrence. We do it preoperatively on the cell, so we have some idea of the perfusion characteristics before the tumor comes out, and then we use MR perfusion afterwards. I'm not as familiar, I'm sorry, with the PET, so I can't comment on that, but I do like the perfusion. Um, I, I will say that, again, you know, a lot of times we're left shaking our heads. Anyone have different opinions? So is PET, PET CT for GB recurrence or this should we have better. dedicated MR perfusion software? Does it help to differentiate pseudo progression for? Right. So we come up with this question a lot at, at our institution as well. And currently we're actually using a combinate. We do use PET, but that's, um, you know, a high, it may not be available everywhere. I, I find perfusion very helpful. We tend to use spectroscopy in perfusion, and I think that they're complementary because spectroscopy, like you mentioned in your talk, can be difficult to uh, interpret, but the combination of spectroscopy and perfusion can be helpful. Although, again, the situation is pretty uncommon, so it's hard to know if that's, I think part of it was the cost effectiveness of this, and so uh, it can be difficult to know if that's. We have another question uh, for Kathleen. Why diffuse anoxic injuries sometimes present as diffuse cortical abnormality versus some cases presenting with basal ganglia? I think that's very interesting. And um, I don't know why it, I think it might be somehow with the nature of um, how the anoxic injury occurred, whether it was. Uh, um, the time course, the onset, and the length of duration. But I think it's very interesting on why sometimes you see diffuse, sometimes you see occipital pulse, sometimes basal ganglia may or may not be involved. And I think what's interesting is the basal ganglia does not always show restricted diffusion. And so I, I think that's a very good question that we don't have the answer to. Well, I can shed some light. Um, uh, basal ganglia is typically more involved when the anoxic event is sudden and abrupt and in younger patients because they have, they're myelinating, the, the basal ganglia is myelinated. Whenever the anoxic insult is more protracted, it's more likely to involve cortex more than the basal ganglia. Mm. Cool. Uh, we have another question. Uh, in case 16, uh, should we include this section on the differentials? Say that again. In case 16, should we include this section on the differential list? In cases of... Your I last case, oh, case yes. number 16. Oh, spontaneous dissection. Yes, absolutely. So, and that's a question that is uh, difficult. Did they dissect spontaneously and then get in their motor vehicle crash? Um, spontaneous dissections have a very classic uh, location and imaging appearance, including a flame-shaped appearance starting at the bifurcation, or else they occur where the uh, carotid artery enters the skull base. Spontaneous vertebral dissections often involve the V3 segment, so between the uh, C1 and the skull base. I think it can be difficult to determine what the etiology is. I think if you have severe trauma and you see that finding, then you think it's blunt cerebral vascular injury. If there's perhaps minor trauma and you see a dissection, then you have to consider whether this was a spontaneous dissection that might have caused, resulted in the trauma somehow. There's another question which pertains to me. There's a question this, is there a clinical role for DTI in spinal cord, like trauma, myelitis? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. In the interest of time, I did not show an example of spinal cord. In fact, there's a lot of work being done in spinal cord DTI, particularly for trauma and MS.
and there are a number of studies that are out there which have which can predict actually outcomes, both motor outcomes and global outcomes based on the FA values uh, of, of the uh, areas that are involved. Uh, more than that, uh, MRI can be normal. Uh, morphologic MRI can be normal. The spinal cord can look normal, and people are doing DTI and coming up with um, FA values and MD values to assess uh, damage to the axons, which we cannot see. So the answer is yes. Again, still we, are, we have some limitation because we still don't know if the FA value is low is because the white matter is damaged or there's something else going on which can lead to low FA value. Any more questions? Thank you all.